call the regular meeting of the San Mateo. Uh, report out. Adjourn. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We adjourned the closed session and there are no reportable items. So now I'm going to call for the um, regular meeting to begin. Roll call, please. Commissioner Bernardo? Here. Commissioner Brennan? Here. President Chang Farley? Present. Commissioner Lorenz? Here. Commissioner Matouche? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Um, it's going to item B. So this is, um, as you know, our general manager's last meeting, technically <coughs> speaking, last regular meeting at least. And uh, so Steve, we want to thank you for all the things that you do <coughs> for the Harbor District. And we also have some commendations for you. So let me um, just read some of these so that we can keep some compliments on you, okay? So this is from the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, and it's to Steve McGrath, San Mateo County Harbor District General Manager, whereas Steve McGrath has been the General Manager of the San Mateo County Harbor District since November 9th, 2015, managing all Harbor District business and activities for Pillar Point and Oyster Point Marina, and whereas <coughs> Steve has worked professionally and cohesively with many agencies, earning the respect of the California Coastal Commission and Coastal Conservancy, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, City of South San Francisco, City of Half Moon Bay, Mid Coast Community Council, Princeton Task Force, San Mateo County Sheriff's Office, <coughs> the Fishing Community, and <coughs> whereas Steve addressed concerns raised by the civil grand jury assuring Lafco that the Harbor District improved upon past practices, moving forward with positive changes, and whereas Steve, with the assistance of the Harbor Commission and staff, has overseen the fiscal responsibility of the San Mateo County Harbor District in paying off the Department of Boating and Waterways loan, leaving the district debt-free, worked to ensure Harbor District reserve balances are sound with cash flow and revenues on track to sustain the Harbor District, saved the Harbor, Dis Harbor District over $250,000 by negotiating contracts, <coughs> oversaw over a million dollars in grant funding from the California Department of Boating and Waterways, and whereas Steve has worked with the Harbor Commission staff and the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors to advance numerous capital improvement projects e.g. Romeo Pier demolition, the Pilot Surfers Beach Sand Replacement Project, and whereas Steve worked to ensure the Harbor District developed an American Disabilities Act transition plan, helped to facilitate the Harbor District's move from at-large elections to district elections, strategic planning for the Harbor District, worked diligently with the City of South San Francisco on a new joint powers agreement as a memo of understanding in the operation of Oyster Point Marina, and whereas Steve, through his commitment to public service as general manager of the San Mateo County Harbor District, has ensured that the Harbor District has met its mission statement of providing a clean, safe, well-managed, financially sound, and environmentally pleasant marinas. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors hereby honors and commends Stephen A. McGraw for his service to the San Mateo County Harbor District as its general manager. So thank you, Steve. This is, we'll do pictures after everything. Thank you. This is from the city of South San Francisco, and I think Liza, will you, will you do us the honor? Sure. Liza, thank you. I'll go later. Um, okay, bear with me another long one, I apologize, um, but well deserved. Um, this is from the city council of the city of South San Francisco. Um, whereas Stephen A. McGrath has been the general manager of the San Mateo <laughs> County Harbor District, overseeing Oyster Point Marina Park and Pillar Point Harbor since November 9, 2015, and the San Mateo County Harbor District established in 1933 by a resolution of the Board of Supervisors who formed the entire area of the County of San Mateo as the district's boundaries, operates Oyster Point Marina Park and Park because of a joint powers agreement that was signed in 1977 and expires in 2026. And, Steve has, and whereas Steve has met jointly over the past three years with the Harbor District Commissioners and South San Francisco City Council members as a part of the Oyster Point Liaison Committee discussing issues related to Oyster Point Marina and Park, 
And whereas Steve has worked closely with Mike Fertrell, city manager of the city of South San Francisco, spending countless hours on crafting a new relevant joint powers agreement with a renewed understanding of obligations for the Oyster Point Marina and Park. And whereas Steve, through his commitment to the community and to the public service, has ensured that the Harbor District, Oyster Point Marina, and Pillar Point Harbor have met the mission statement to assure the public is provided with clean, safe, well-managed, financially sound, and environmentally pleasant marinas. And, whereas Steve plans to spend his retirement with his wife, Sandy, as well as his three adult children and three grandchildren, Lupe, Liam, and Penelope, and whereas, during his retirement, Steve plans to travel and work on projects of my own choosing, <laughs> <laughs> now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of South San Francisco does hereby recognize and congratulate Steve for his years of dedicated service to the San Mateo County Harbor District and congratulates him on his retirement. Thank you, Thank you Eliza. <coughs> Steve, don't rest on your walls just yet. You have one more from us. This is from the San Mateo County Harbor District Commission. Uh, and this is to honor Stephen A. McGraw, proclaimed by the San Mateo County Harbor District Board of Commissioners, County of San Mateo, State of California, that, whereas Steve McGraw has been the general manager of the San Mateo County Harbor District for three years since November 9, 2015, professionally managing all district business and activities, and whereas under Steve's leadership, the San Mateo County Harbor District received the Distinguished Special District Leadership Foundation's Certificate of Transparency, and whereas during Steve's tenure, he has stabilized the Harbor District staff by, filing open, or by filling open positions, increased morale among the staff, negotiated five-year memorandum of understanding contracts for both bargaining units, and whereas Steve would say that one of the highlights of his career was the standing show of support he received from the Pillar Point and Oyster Point staff at the board meeting of January 17, 2018, and whereas Steve has been well respected by agencies including the California Coastal Commission and Coastal Conservancy, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, City of South San Francisco, City of Half Moon Bay, Mid Coast Community Council, as well as the local fishing community and various other associations, and whereas Steve, with the assistance of the Harbor Commission and staff, have achieved the following fiscal benefits to the district. Paid off Department of Boating and Waterways loan, leaving the district debt free. Work to ensure district reserve balances are sound with cash flow and revenues on track to sustain the district. Pay down 50% of CalPERS unfunded liability. Save the district $150,000 moving to SDRMA. Revised recology contract resulting in $115,000 savings. And whereas Steve, with the assistance of the Harbor Commission and staff, has received over a million dollars in grant from funding from Department of Boating and Waterways for boat demolition and dredging, and whereas Steve has worked with the Harbor Commission and staff to complete the following projects, Romeo Pier demolition, the Radon rebuild, Pillar Point Harbor sidewalk project, new electrical transformers and parking and lot asphalt projects at both PPH and OPM, made significant progress on all approved capital improvement projects, projects such as the Pilot Surfers Beach Replenishment Project and dock repairs at PPH and OPM, and whereas Steve ensured that the Harbor District has an ADA transition plan assisted in moving the Harbor District from at-large elections to districted elections, work to develop a strategic plan for the Harbor District, work comprehensively with the City of South San Francisco on a new joint powers agreement with a renewed understanding of obligations for Oyster Point Marina Park, and whereas Steve has left his mark on the district through his commitment to his job as general manager, his role as a public servant, his commitment to transparency, and the public process for the greater good of all San Mateo County residents to ensure that the public is provided with clean, safe, well-managed, financially sound, and environmentally pleasant marinas. Therefore, it is hereby resolved by the San Mateo County Harbor District Board of Harbor Commissioners, County of San Mateo, State of California, that Stephen A. McGraw is commended and thanked for his years of service and accomplishment at the San Mateo County Harbor District upon his retirement as general manager. Steve, this is from. Thank you.
Steve, I don't know if you um, want to say anything. Uh, and you probably want to make a motion. I ask for a motion on the resolution. Oh, yes. Okay. So, there are th at least from all, there are three resolutions. So, is there a motion to approve those resolutions so that we can get this in the books? So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussions about resolutions? Just for the, those. Yeah. I'm confused because we don't approve resolutions, do we? No, that, that, no, are, that are well, from other agencies. No, yeah, for ours. ours. For yeah. ours. So that's I'm sorry, one. 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 Not, yes, three. Yeah, not three. Yes, yeah, one. I, I'll, was there a motion? Yes. Yeah. I'll second. Oh, Spencer, do you have okay. one discussion? Do you have anything? No. Okay. Discussion. Okay. Sorry, Debbie. It was just one from us. So, okay. So if we could do a roll call, that'd be great. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. President Chancarella? Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Aye. The motion carries unanimously. <coughs> Thank you, Steve. Do you want to say anything? We can wait. Well, funny you should ask. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, President Chankarani. Thank you, Harvard Commission. Thank you to the County of San Mateo Board of Supervisors and to the City of South San Francisco uh, City Council. Uh, tonight is my 87th and last meeting as general manager of the district. Um, I have these comments, uh, they're a little longer than I would like. Uh, I think it was, uh, maybe it was Churchill again who said, uh, please excuse the long letter. I didn't have time to write a short one. This concludes 13 years of service in the public sector, which followed six years of work for an NGO after a career in construction. In my work for the nonprofit, I supported the heroic work of the staff interacting with our disadvantaged clients. This fit well with my personal mindset and value system. I was conflicted when offered a job at a Harvard district and wondered how this would fit with my concept of public service. A friend and mentor said the government work is right livelihood, and I have remembered that to this day. To serve the public, be a steward of the public's resources, promote public safety, protection of the environment, and transparency is indeed right livelihood. And I can say with certainty that this district is well served by a staff who know the meaning and practice of public service. And I see some of that staff in it audience this evening. To quote Theodore Roosevelt, far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. I'm glad too that my public service has been in the world of special districts and Harvard districts in particular. This district serves the public in a way that would not be possible in a larger agency. The commission and staff are closer to the public we serve than in most other forms of government. The control is truly local and responsive. The Department of Boating and Waterways became, in the name of efficiency, a division of state parks. This may be marginally more efficient, but I do not believe that DBW is as responsive to the needs of the boating community as before, although still very responsive evidence the grants we receive. But government is not designed to be efficient. It is designed to be accountable and transparent. And so it is with local government. Tip O'Neill is often quoted as saying that all politics is local, and in my mind, the more local, the better. The recreational and commercial fishermen, the sailors, dog walkers, beachgoers, restaurant owners and guests, runners and surfers cannot be served as responsibly as they are when served by a professional staff working under the governance of an elected body whose purpose it is to, once again, ensure the public is provided with clean, safe, well-managed, financially sound and environmentally pleasant marinas. It's often said that our goal in life should be to leave the world a better place than we found it. I believe that while there are many things I leave unaccomplished, I leave the Harbor District a better place than I found it. I did not, of course, do this alone. I did it with the support of an amazing staff. I wanted to be able to avoid mentioning any names because I would miss someone, but I cannot understate the support I received when I first arrived and the commitment to their work and their teams exhibited by Jim Merlo in the audience this evening and John Draper. These two, and by extension, their teams at Oyster Point and Pillar Point, educated me, supported me, advocated for their teams, and served the public with humor and grace. I wish John all the best in his retirement, and I thank Jim for his continued service. I would be remiss, also, having started down this slippery slope, if I did not also thank John Lauren and Anita Pyle. 
two stalwart professional executives who have helped this district enormously. As, a, as said earlier, uh, well, Anita um, will also be leaving, uh, but not now until uh, February to help in the transition. And I wish you, Anita, the best in San Diego. John uh, will, uh, I presume, be the new interim GM. And I wish John all the best in this new role. I stand ready to support you in the coming weeks and after in any way that I can. Don't mention any names, he said. You'll hurt someone's feelings, he said. It was never a truer maxim that, than that when one finds oneself in a hole, first thing, stop digging. Wish I'd learned that one. So I have to also mention Debbie Garrett, who will do whatever it takes to get the job done. Will stay as late as necessary to get the board package out. Will in ways hidden and unhidden go the extra mile for the district. Your support, and dare I say affection, uh, have meant the world to me. Thank you. And to all of you that I have not named, know that I value and respect you, and thank you for your past, present, and future service to the district, our stakeholders, the fishing community, tourists, and all the others from around the country, state, and world, who visit and enjoy our coasts and go home safely as a result of your work. I wish this board well, and hope that the new board will be in place in a couple of months, will continue the progress we have made. Governance is a tricky thing, balancing the inherent tension between leadership and representation. And recognizing sometimes that decisions are made by the majority when a minority might not agree. But to provide the public with any degree of clarity requires a level of submission to the decisions of the body. Seems I can't avoid, avoid Churchill. It was quoted as saying that democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried from time to time. I recall when I first started attending symphony concerts and recognized the 70 artistic talents on the stage, all subverting their individual goals or aspirations to the greater good. Wonderful music appreciated by the audience. The whole was so much greater than the sum of its parts, and this is what I wish for the district going forward. And I know that the district, with thoughtful, respectful leadership, who have checked egos at the door, governing a dedicated team of hardworking public servants, is indeed capable of a whole greater than anything possible if discord and acrimony were to take the place of vigorous yet respectful debate in a way that leads to the best result for the people we serve. Thank you all, commissioners, staff, the public, for the opportunity to have been of service. Thank you, Steve. Now we actually have to do the Harbor District's business today. Yes. <laughs> so um, I am going to open it up to public comment, and I have a couple of public comment speaker cards, and th this is for items that are not on the agenda. So I'd like to call up Sherry Ingalls. I'm Sherry Ingalls, owner of Malcolm Bay Sport Fishing. Uh, three items that are not on the agenda. First of all, uh, the sidewalk project in, in uh, Pillar Point was completed, and I've got to say that the co uh, cement company did an absolutely fantastic job. Uh, they were extremely professional, easy to work with, did an absolutely amazing job as far as I'm concerned. So they were worth, worth every penny that uh, was spent on that project um, for that, that company. Um, number two, uh, part of that project included changing to the parking lot. And uh, we all knew that we were going to be losing uh, one section of the parking to that sidewalk, which was fine. But it has kind of uh, snowballed, where now there is a second row of two-hour parking that was not anticipated. And with all the different user groups in the harbor now, that parking lot has gotten extremely congested to the point where, like this morning, I was there at six o'clock in the morning, there was not a single parking spot to be had, other than two rows of open two-hour parking. Uh, so I think at this point, the harbor really needs to consider, the commission needs to consider uh, addressing the parking situation at the whole entire location, not just the front parking lot, but all the parking lot there, there has been a lot of changes over the last several years and it really needs to be 
uh, analyzed and see what would work out best for everything. Uh, being a charter boat operator, uh, we actually pay a fee for every person at that on our boats that is supposed to be for parking. Our, par our customers now have to park in the far ends of the parking lot at, and coming there at 5 or 6 a.m. when it's extremely dark with all their equipment which is putting us at jeopardy and the harbor at jeopardy if those people were injured. So it's something that really needs to be addressed. Um, number three, I have no idea at all whether this is even a possibility, um, but I know the harbor's looking at different options for a location for your facility here. Um, I've been noticing that there is a new fire station being built down the street. What's going to happen with the old fire station? It has an ocean view. It has a good amount of space. Easy could be converted to a conference room. I don't know if it would be available, but if it is a possibility, I think it should be looked into. And that would do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Robert Ingalls. Thank you, commissioners. Um, hi, my name's, uh, I'll go by Bob, Bob Ingalls. I, along with Sherry, we are co-owners of the Queen of Hearts fishing vessel. I run the boat myself and have been since 1990. And uh, we both co-own the Half Moon Bay sport fishing. And the parking, I'm trying not to be too repetitive here, so obviously we're like-minded. Um, the parking has turned into a major issue. Kind of unexpected, I think, the way it's, the way it's turning out. Losing the front row to that wonderful promenade, by the way, with the greatly, vastly improved uh, handicapped access. I think it's an excellent job. And congratulations to everybody involved in that. But I think the trade-off was kind of expected. We're going to lose some parking places in the front, but everybody gets a little more room on the on the sidewalk and the promenade. You know, more tables out there for the restaurants and more room for the people and have more access for people in wheelchairs, which is a great thing. But the parking situation all of a sudden has just imploded. And I'll give an example. Four o'clock in the morning is when I get there every day. I come in and I get the store ready to go, and I go down and get the boat ready. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, this is before the, the recreational craft season even opened up, there were 10 parking places. 10. And before it was even there. And so, and it, it, I'm not trying to rain on anybody's parade, you know, but something has to be done. And whether it turns it into day use only, no parking at nighttime, long-term parking, like at an airport, the longer you're going to stay, the further away you got to go. I mean, it's, it's logic. And to me, it is anyways. I'm sure there's a lot of guys who won't feel that way. And uh, we all have our little, we're creatures of habit. Most of the guys in the harbor have a, their little spot they like to park in all the time. Myself, my employees, they are going to be parking behind the store. No more out in front because we need every spot we can get. But, you know, I get it. You get off the boat, you've been out there all day long, you're beat up, or you've been out there two, three, four days, whatever it is. The last thing you want to do is work further, walk further away to get to your car. I know you want to get your car and go home. But the situation the way it is now calls for change. And what, it, what it's going to be and how it's going to evolve, I don't know. But that's what we came here for, to kind of get the process started. It's not going to happen overnight. But uh, it has to change. And I'll just pretty much leave it as that, except I will we'll repeat one more thing. Starting, I believe, it was in 1988 when I was working at Captain John's, was when the harbor started that, per, that fee, per person fee to the charter boats, specifically for parking. At that time, there was, I think, 16 or 15 charter boats, and they were the biggest user group. It was before people sold fish off the dock, which is the greatest thing that ever happened to the, especially the smaller commercial fishermen. Um, the buyers will probably argue about that, but uh, it's, it's been good for the harbor too. Now there's an awful lot, there's even more people there. So there's my minutes, but Thank there you. it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, so now we are on to item C2, commissioner comments. Um, Sabrina? Um, thanks. So uh, I just wanted to mention that um, Congratulations to Commissioner Moranis and to Nancy Raring for their um, landslide victories. And uh, it's my understanding that uh, Commissioner-elect Raring will be serving starting, is it January 
fifth, or when is the? The earliest um, Commissioner Rarey could take office would be the. It's defined as the first Monday after the first day of the year, which in 2019 is January the seventh. January the seventh. So. Um, She'll be a commissioner effective January the 7th and is a commissioner-elect right now. And I just wanted to mention that um, their uh, <coughs> vote count, which of course we know votes are still being counted in San Mateo County, so the vote count is not complete, is extremely impressive um, with Commissioner Lorenis receiving almost 40%, 39.25% of the vote, and uh, commissioner-elect raring uh, receiving 30.73 percent so um, those number those percentages have been consistent throughout the vote count and um, just very impressive results so congratulations to you both and look forward to serving with both of you thank you Ed? thank you sabrina um, so I'm just going to report very quickly on a few things I did in November. I was asked to give a presentation on what the harbor is doing in wildlife protection at the fourth annual Central California Coast Wildlife Disturbance Symposium at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. So I talked to uh, a group of people, both, both not, uh, NGOs who uh, work on wildlife protection, people like Audubon Society and Sierra Club, and then also folks from state parks, Coast Guard, NOAA, who uh, also work on wildlife protection, even some, some people from the Bureau of Land Management. So I was very happy to be able to give a talk on this, and one of the main reasons I was able to do a presentation was because of our operations manager, John Morin, working with our, our public, people from Audubon, um, in particular, people from the Marine Mammal Center, asking for just some, some changes to what the Harbor District's been doing. It's pretty basic stuff, but really important in terms of wildlife protection, so that pres presentation was very well received, and I, I thank you, John, for the work you've been doing with our public. Um, I also went to a U.S. <coughs> excuse me, a USGS Point Blue. Point Blue used to be the Point Reyes Bird Observatory, Observatory. They do a lot of work on on um, bird protection, but they also have a group that does mathematical modeling and how to present that their data to the public. So they partnered with USGS, who is partnering with several universities who are, are using um, coastal modeling to understand what's going to happen with sea level rise. And so they actually have working with Point Blue, they're making available modeling pro programs via the internet to the public, and mainly for agencies that are responsible for doing planning, like said, at this meeting there were folks from uh, Half Moon Bay Planning, for example, and we were just trying out the software so we could see what's going to happen depending on whether the sea, lo sea level rises three feet or centime centimeters, whatever. The, the software will show you what to expect. And also, one of the other parameters was whether the, pub, whether the agencies did anything to protect the land or whether they, they didn't do anything. And so you could play with those parameters and actually have a look at what will happen at Pillar Point Harbor or at Surfer's Beach. Um, and I'll report back on that once, once I go back to the meeting and uh, again and work on the software with them. It's, it's something that will at some point be available for the public. That's it. Great. Thank you. Tom? Tom, good. Robert? Nothing. Okay, I just have something really short. I also want to congratulate Nancy and Ed on their victory, and I look forward yeah. to working with y'all. Um, I just got this today from the League of Women Voters, and just to give y'all some context, they reached out to the Harbor District to do um, a review with respect to access and, and transparency. And they assess the following areas, public engagement and connection with um, local government, current strengths and or obstacles in successfully communicating with the Harbor District to find the meeting agendas, obtain information, solve a problem, etc. 
um, best practices achieved that can be shared with other public agencies and public, the public's ability to help by understanding their role and becoming informed and meaningful contributors. So I'm glad to say that the Harbor District thought an excellent in meeting its constituents' quote-unquote expectations with regards, with regards to transparency and accountability. I just got this letter today. Um, so I wanted to, y'all can look at it, but I was going to give it to Debbie to put this into the public record because I think it's a great thing for the Harbor District. And mm -hmm. thank you to the commissioners and to staff and actually to the public mm -hmm. too for helping us do this and achieve this. So do y'all want to look at this or you want me to give it to, it's just an assessment. But Debbie, if you wouldn't mind putting it in the public record, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that's really all I have to say. Okay. I'd like yeah. to pull some things off. Consent. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Well, let me just let me okay. just close commissioner <coughs> comments, and now we're going to go to item D, which is the consent calendar. Sabrina, um, one through six and eight. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, and eight. Okay, so I'm going to pull those off. Is there a motion to approve? 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And seven. And seven. And seven, sorry. Oh, sorry. It's like a sandwich between six and eight. Yes. Yeah. So moved. I'll second. second. Okay. <laughs> wow, I'm enthusiastic tonight. Okay. So is there any discussion? <clears throat> nope. Okay. Roll call, please, Debbie. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. President Shane Kelly? Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Bernardo? Aye. So the motion carries. Um, so let's see. The, now we're going to get to our discussion item. And actually, I'm going to move, as I've always done, um, bills and claims, which is <coughs> item number one, which was on the consent because. <coughs> We want to get the business done, and we do need to write checks to pay our bills. So, Sabrina, you wanted this off of the consent. Is there anything um, you wanted to add about that? Just um, two things. One is a question. Um, well, I noticed that there were two very large bills here, one for $236,982.99 for Golden Bay Construction, and I just wasn't sure which project that was for, so I was curious what that was for? Uh, sidewalk project. Okay, so that was for the sidewalk. And was that the whole thing or was that partial? No, no that was a partial. Uh, it, it partial. Uh, we still have, uh, we just did, in fact, I did a walk through today and identified some issues that are on a punch list at present. Okay. So uh, we still need to finalize the Okay. Project. So we're holding our attention. Yes. Got it. Okay. And then the second thing I wanted to mention is just um, point out that our legal fees from Hanson Bridget are $107,736.13 this month. Um, so just wanted to note that. That's all. Okay. Any other uh, <coughs> discussions on the bills and claims? Yep. Motion okay. to approve. Second. Okay. Um, if there's no discussion, roll call, please, Debbie. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. Commissioner Bernardin? Aye. President Shankar? Aye. So the motion carries. Um, now we're going to go to our regular discussion items. So the first item is item 18, which is the interim general manager. Um, so we <coughs> have, I'm not sure procedurally how we, were, we should do this if we're going to approve the compensation. Thank you. There was no reportable item, but um, we must approve compensation um, at a regular meeting, and this would be a regular meeting. I don't understand why the contract is not in this report. That is a closed session. That's why we have to approve the contract. If we have to an agreement on the compensation, which we are. But that's, that's the thing. The contract can't be Wait, made public? No. Maybe we should take a recess and we'll talk about this. Can we take three minute recess? Well, what, do we need to do this item first? Can we, we do the other <coughs> items? Can we do the other items first? Yeah, let's do that so that the public doesn't have to sit through this. Yeah. 
Okay. Can Re remind remind yes. the commission yes. the issues related to regular and special meetings. And yes. Separate yep. benefits. Yep. yep. Okay, so then we'll move on to item number 19, which is the Water Emergency Transportation Authority, the Weta Ferry Services. There's a quick presentation. And um, Steve, do you want to, you're the lead on this in terms of the staff report. Is there anything you wanted to add to this? Uh, no, when we've got the staff report, I will introduce Okay, these. great. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, Keith Stonkey, Manager of Operations and Maintenance for Water Emergency Transportation Authority in the San Francisco Bay Region. I have a short, hopefully it's short, uh, presentation on our ferry services focusing on the San Francisco, South San Francisco Ferry Service. Uh, some background on our organization. We are a public transit agency operating in the Bay Area region. We have four routes in the San Francisco Bay. We're going to be adding a new route in January to Richmond. We currently serve Vallejo, Oakland, Alameda, Harbor Bay, and South San Francisco, also downtown San Francisco locations. Uh, we carry approximately 3 million people a day, 10,000, or sorry, 3 million people a year, 10,000 10, people a day throughout the San Francisco Bay, primarily commuters and recreational riders as well. Uh, for South San Francisco service, uh, we're carrying about 144,000 people a year. Uh, I borrowed this presentation from our planners. They do a really good job laying out our strategic plans and goals and provide information to the public. So I thought that'd be good to use their presentation. So this is just some background on the South San Francisco ferry service in general. We started ferry service in 2012 and each year we've had growth and it's been great growth. Uh, we're up to currently 665 people a day operating on our commute service route. This is a chart showing our daily ridership averages over those since the start. Uh, one thing I would like to point out, there was a huge leap approximately the beginning of year two. That was, those two spikes were due to the BART strike, which had a dramatic effect on mm -hmm. all of our ferry service, but really, really jump-started the South San Francisco ferry service. You can see we had a huge spike, and then when the BART <coughs> service uh, BART service was reestablished, it dropped back down again, but it started that trend. A lot of people got the word about ferry service in general, and it, it really, we've had a lot of growth over the past eight years. Fairbox Recovery, this is how financial viable uh, the services are. Uh, one of our mandates from our funding agencies are we have to achieve 40% fare box recovery uh, by year three. Well, we didn't quite do that, but we are showing a really good trend. It's continually going up and we're currently at 36%. We're very close to meeting that objective. With all of our services, we have had huge growth, so we have dramatically uh, increased our new riders. Uh, we have quite a few loyal riders as well. So the purple highlights 10 years plus, uh, San Francisco is less than 10. But for all of our services, we've seen dramatic growth with a lot of new riders just in the past two years. Uh, with more riders in pretty much the same capacity, our vessels have become more crowded. Uh, some of our peak trips in the Central Bay, Alameda, Oakland to San Francisco, Harbor Bay to San Francisco, and the South San Francisco Ferry Service, we're running into capacity issues. We aren't quite at maximum, but it starts getting very full on our peak trips. Even our South San Francisco trips are, are edging into a very crowded boat. Uh, for the North Bay trip from Vallejo, we are actually at capacity, regularly turning people away on a few of our key uh, peak commute trips. Also, we have some of these issues on uh, recreational trips as well. 
So even though we are getting crowded, we still have a lot of people satisfied with our ferry service. Uh, you'd think it would be pretty easy to be better than BART, but we, we are proud of, uh, of people are very happy riding our ferries. And what's not to like about riding a boat to work every day? Uh, so our riders have choices. You know, we're not the only, only transportation option. Uh, sorry, that chart didn't come out very well, but uh, primarily uh, other forms of transit are available. There are very few people that ferry is the only option they have. But we do, uh, we see a lot of people would, would, would generally be in their own car if we weren't operating. So there's some of the common reasons of why people choose the ferry. And uh, traffic is obviously a big, a big uh, concern with people over the Bay Bridge corridor, particularly with the congestion on the Bay Bridge, Highway 80 from Vallejo, and also BART is very crowded. Um, but we're quite happy to uh, provide people with a really enjoyable ride quality and relaxing. How often is your commute described as uh, ride uh, ride quality and re relaxing. So our rider profiles, we generally get a lot of commuters um, and uh, generally at the higher end of the uh, Bay Area medium for incomes. So our commuters are obviously primarily going to work, but uh, quite the majority of our riders, commuter riders, are riding five days a week. Uh, we have a pretty good group of people that ride three to four days a week, but uh, you know, there's a lot of people we see every day uh, take them to work. Our recreational riders, these folks are uh, much less frequent, but it's probably close to 50% of our ridership, uh, especially in the summer. Um, but what's, un what's different is uh, these folks generally don't see the ferries as public transportation. They, this is not, they will not get on a bus, BART, they don't have a clipper card. These folks see this as an excursion, a ride, an event. Uh, it's quite different from our commuters who are used to taking buses and uh, BART. Uh, another thing that we've seen tremendous growth with uh, over the past five, six years is bicycles. Uh, bicycles have become extremely important to get the last mile showing up to our ferry terminal and also getting to work uh, from the vessel. Uh, we've done the best we can uh, with providing ample racks and bike lockers at our terminals, but yet people, because we would prefer them being stored on shore, they take up a lot of space. It's difficult to accommodate, but um, the, it's a challenge to carry the bikes. But South San Francisco Ferry Service is leading the percentage of bike riders. Uh, you can see on one trip, uh, our 740, we had 133 passengers, 73 bicycles. 55% uh, of our passengers have bicycles for South San Francisco. This is great though, when they get to South San Francisco, they have a, a, a low impact way of getting to work. And also this helps our ferry terminals. Our ferry terminals have uh, parking problems. And that's another reason why the, the bikes are so popular. Some of our other ferry services like Vallejo has a much smaller percentage, uh, only 8%. And these are very specific, uh, specific to South San Francisco in general. Uh, once again, talking about the last mile in the South San Francisco area, um, primarily the, our passengers walk to their des final destination quite a few ride, and then there's also quite a few employee shuttles that pick up people, take them to their uh, places of employment. What can we improve? Well, there's always things we could do better. Um, one of the things we constantly hear about is better Wi-Fi. Uh, that's a real challenge for us on vessels. Uh, out on the water, we don't have good cell phone or Wi-Fi reception, but we try to provide with the best we can. Uh, waiting at our terminals. Uh, our terminals are not really set up to queue up hundreds of people. We have very small terminals. They're basically oversized bus terminals. Um, and with the rapid growth of ridership, I'm sure you're all aware how difficult it is to get any projects done around the water. Adding structures and canopies generally impact other users in the area. So it's difficult to uh, update our facilities uh, to 
make them weatherproof. And generally, most of our pastures are arrive just before departure. They generally don't wait for more than 10 minutes to, before they board our vessels. Uh, also, frequency of ferry service. Everybody would like more ferries. Uh, some of our services started off pretty much hour uh, between each departure. Uh, some of our services now we're at 30 minutes. That's still not quite the same as buses, which tend to operate much shorter. So what we're doing well, we have very good crews. Uh, that's always come up very high in our customer surveys. We do try to keep our boats clean. Uh, we're also very pr proud of our on-time performance and reliability as well. Uh, another uh, area we're also really proud about is our access for people with disabilities. And that's primarily my presentation. I was going to add a little bit about dredging. We're currently working on a dredging project with staff. They've been very helpful for us. The terminal was first dredged in 10 years ago with the initial construction. Uh, we're currently been working for well over a year to get all the regulatory permits in place. Uh, the staff has been very helpful. Uh, we are waiting for one last permit. Uh, BCDC is uh, processing <coughs> our last permit. We should be dredging any day now. Once that permit is approved, our uh, dredging firm is ready to go. Uh, it is a pretty big project. We are looking at approximately 36,000 cubic yards. Uh, one of our challenges is, is that we're operating in the marina. We don't want to interfere with any of the tenants. So we're making special accommodations not to interfere with tenants. And we also don't want to disrupt our ferry operations. So this really limits the hours of operation for dredging. Uh, that is one of the issues we have. Also disposal costs uh, compared to the original dredging, we have to do deep ocean disposal compared to the local disposal that we uh, had done in the past. Anyway, we're hoping that this dredging will be completed in about by mid-December. Um, and we don't think we'll have to dredge for about eight more years after that. So if there's any questions about the ferry service in general or specifically to South San Francisco and Oyster Point, I'm happy to answer any of those questions now. I just have a comment. Um, so um, I had the pleasure of serving on the Water Transit Advocates many years ago, like over 12 years ago, um, with then Mayor Howard of Redwood City and Mayor Gonzalez in South San Francisco. So it's just really nice to see the ferry service succeeding like this. Um, I think it's a great benefit for residents. And um, thank you for the presentation tonight. And is, uh, I spoke with Steve earlier, and the uh, development going on in that area is incredible, as you know. And I think we will be very soon expanding ferry service, having to provide more trips and larger vessels, and probably take a new look at which routes they may be serving out of there as well. Tony? <clears throat> I've enjoyed uh, seeing the ferry pick up. <clears throat> I remember uh, coming to Harbor District meetings and talking about a ferry before it existed and using that harbor long before the ferry terminal was there. I uh, truly enjoyed following Robert's exploits of going to and from Alameda. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, that's still current, but I guess you're working on that. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, and it's particularly nice to hear you say that you're going to watch out for our tenants when you do your dredging. Take lots of mud out of there, please. Ed. A couple of questions for you. Uh, first is, you did mention growth just a moment ago. Could you tell us a little more about what, what the plans are for South San Francisco in general? And is there something that you can do with the district to help you achieve your goals? Well, we're right now things are going well. It's of all the routes, that one is currently slightly under our targets for ridership. So we have a little bit of room for growth. <coughs> Uh, that's good because all of our other routes are pretty maxed out. So we are building, currently we have 15 vessels in our fleet. We have five under construction and we're retiring two this year. So as we build up our fleet, 
we will have more resources to be able to use not only larger boats or but be able to schedule more frequent service. And my last question, do you have a sense of why your ridership is lower at Oyster Point? Well, I think one of the reasons it's the newest ferry route in the bay. Mm -hmm. It's been in its service for almost eight years, but we've seen that for every route on San Francisco Bay, that it takes time to build up. Uh, this, is, this one is a little different too. It's, it's not only the newest route, but it's the only route that does not go to the hub, San Francisco. So this is an Oakland, Alameda to pretty much an employment destination. And that is not quite the, the model of all of the other ferry routes on the bay right now. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Sabrina? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I was really happy to hear you mention the, um, the numbers as far as people who are bringing their bikes on board. And I know that um, there is a contingent of people who really like traveling on the ferry uh, with their bicycles and that there's bike racks provided and that sort of thing. So um, I'd be interested to follow the growth of that uh, part of the transportation. Um, so if there was a way for us to get maybe, and this is the, I think the first time I recall Weta coming to one of our meetings, at least in the last few Maybe five years. Yeah, it's probably yeah. been a while. Yeah. So bike, you could, yeah, if bike. You guys, if we could get an update uh, more frequently. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, bike rider, bike <coughs> use on our vessels has just grown tremendously. We actually track that now, how many bicycles are on our vessels. And that doesn't even count the bikes at the terminals. <coughs> we have hundreds of bikes at the terminals as well. It's very difficult to achieve bike. Uh, storage on vessels, We our newest vessel, 400 passenger boat, has capacity for 50 bicycles, and we will carry 50 bicycles with 400 people. Unfortunately, that takes up, that's probably 50 seats <coughs> that we're losing. Uh, bikes are, 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 we would prefer the bikes be stored on shore, and, and you know, the bike share would be a great option. Um, it's difficult to carry bikes, but we understand why <coughs> people want to do it, and it's a great amenity that we're providing. Yeah, I know the connectivity too when you reach, if your destination is South San Francisco, mm -hmm. has been somewhat challenging, although there is the new bike lane, which is great. Um, so it'd be nice to hear more about how the connectivity issues are getting ironed out in the future, because I've heard from a lot of people that they can't use the service because they don't work in a place that provides that's a shuttle true. bus. Mm -hmm. And I know that's been sort of an on, ongoing issue. So mm -hmm. at maybe some future point, it'd be great to hear from the city too about how those issues were getting addressed. Um, one thing I was curious about though, you mentioned that there was 144,000 riders per year on the South San Francisco route. And then you said there was 665 people riding per day and there were 12,000 people per month. And if you take 365 days times 650 people, you get 242,725 people. Um, or more likely, if you divide 144,000, uh, you get 394 people. Well, 300 and 94 and a half people per day. So I was just curious. So I did check that, but it we do only offer commute service. So that's a Monday through Friday. We don't operate on weekends and holidays. Mm -hmm. So there's a few less days that we wouldn't be a full. Oh, year. I see. So if it's seven days a week, it works out to 394.5 people per day. Okay. I just wanted to make that clear because it was confusing hearing the I was thinking, wow, the ridership has really gone up if you've got 665. Yeah, people per day per would be the seven days a week. Days. Yeah, okay. So three, 394 and a half. Um, the other last thing I had was just, um, you know, it constantly comes up as a harbor commissioner. People want to know what's going on at Oyster Point, and everybody says, oh, there's this beautiful ferry terminal there, which is so true. Um, and then there's this assumption that the Harbor District owns and operates the ferry terminal. And so I find myself constantly having to explain to people that 
actually, we don't own it and we don't operate it. Um, this agency called WETA does it. And so I thought it might be helpful for people to understand uh, what the relationship between the district and, and what it is and how the how WETA paid, helped pay down part of our division of voting and waterways loan mm -hmm. by cutting a check <coughs> and sending it directly to voting and waterways. So the money actually never changed hands with the district. The money actually went from WETA direct to voting and <coughs> waterways to help pay down our loan. And I don't, that must have been, you said, eight years or something? Oh, that was probably 12 years ago when that was all, and I think more like 10 when it was final. Well, it was before construction started, that was all uh, worked out. And I think a lot of people don't realize that that was it. That was a one-time only payment, and there mm -hmm. isn't any revenue coming to the Harbor District at all. We don't have a lease arrangement with WETA. So the Harbor District got this one time, well, we didn't get the payout, but it paid down our loan back you know, 11 years ago, mm -hmm. and that was the end of any monies coming in from WETA. And so now, you know, they operate as their own agency, we operate as our agency, and there's not really any crossover because we don't receive lease payments. So I just wanted to right. make sure I understood that correctly so that I'm explaining it to the public and that's that's my understanding as well we are a public transit agency we are not making money operating ferry service right. we're spending public money in the interest of the communities and we're working with great partners in the harbor district and the staff and the and the impetus for starting the agency was to help provide emergency transportation in the event of an earthquake if i understand that correct that's that's another unique role that we have we're the only transit agency in California, and who knows, I'm not even sure about the US, but we're the only transit agency in California that has this emergency response role. Uh, where we have a coordinating role for maritime assets in the Bay Area primarily, and we would also use our resources in the event of emergency. I really appreciate you coming, thank you. Great, and yeah, we should uh, schedule, make this more uh, frequent and occurring. I have a comment, but go yeah, ahead. Very quickly, a minor point of clarification. Um, there is, in fact, a lease agreement with WETA that it was executed in, back then in that time period, 55 years, uh, $3.6 million that went from WETA to DBW was considered a sort of lump sum rent payment all at one time, all in advance, and didn't, as you say, pass through us. But there is, in fact, an agreement that governs the relationship. And, and we're, we're a tenant of the, we're of the a, te technically a tenant of the Harbor District. Okay, and right. part of that was related that to, and I'm sure you know, capital funds versus operating funds. Uh, we have a very difficult time getting operating funds, so we front-loaded this uh, lease basically with capital funding to, to help our, keep our operating costs lower throughout the uh, services. Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. So thank you for being here. I. Um, I actually asked, I was, I listened to a presentation that one of the Chambers of Commerce did about transportation and when I heard the WETA presentation I thought, oh my gosh, they should be presenting something at one of our meetings. So this was the earliest date that we could get them to be here, so that's why they're here. But thank you for partnering with us. Um, we also have, we, I think we issue commercial activity permits for private ferries, too, a yes. couple of private ferries. Mm -hmm. So are y'all working with them at all in terms yes. of, uh, can you there just is, tell us how y'all are working with the private uh, ferries? There, well, primarily, <coughs> we're not involved when they're entering in, or operating out of the Oyster Point Marina. That's directly with the operators uh, and the Harbor District, but we're working with them to share a dock, some of our docks okay. on, on the other side of the bay. Okay. Great. Well, y'all do a great job, and I think it's it's awesome that there's an alternative mode of transportation <coughs> to get cars off the road and try to hopefully ease this congestion a little bit. Well, and it it's it definitely helps keep congestion off the bridges, yeah. the bar, and it also helps keep uh, congestion out of your area too. The approaches into the marina, uh, you don't need all those cars, and nobody likes it. <coughs> okay, great. Thank you. Great. There's really no action um, necessary except to receive the presentation. So if there are no more questions.
questions or discussion um, points, then I will move to item 20, which is the Oyster Point Marina and Park uh, potential Thank you, new. Keith. Thanks, Keith. Potential new agreement with South San Francisco. Um, Steve, would you like to take it away and then I'll open up. We have quite a few public comment cards here, so I do want to open <coughs> that up but after the staff, after you Thank give you. your report. Thank you, President Chancarelli, and I've got just a couple of comments uh, to make while uh, Debbie is setting up the slide presentation. Um, I think the first thing I want to say is to, to give thanks to all of the district and the city teams for all of the hard and challenging work that we've accomplished over the last couple of years. Can we decrease the size? There we go. Perfect. You can also do that on the um, device. Thank you. Um, I'll mention this uh, again in the, in the presentation, but I'd also particularly like to uh, give a shout out to District Council Steve Miller, who um, we, we sort of joke about when I'm asking for small C or capital C council. Capital C is uh, legal implications, and small C is just uh, what do you think? And uh, Steve has consistently provided uh, me with both small and large C council. Uh, and uh, uh, we would not, without a doubt, be where we are today on this agreement without uh, Steve's help. So thank you very much. You, Steve. The result of all that work is a good agreement that serves the public. And that, of course, is the mission of both the district and the city. Our mission statement particularly says that we shall Ensure that the public is provided with clean, safe, well-managed, financially sound, and environmentally pleasant marinas. This agreement does exactly that. Uh, I don't think our mission statement has had quite such an air in one meeting in, in quite a while. When under this commission's direction, we set out to negotiate an agreement with South City. We did not set out to win. We set out to reach a fair, comprehensible, clear agreement that would properly delineate responsibilities, provide clear procedures for exiting the agreements, the agreement at certain points or under certain circumstances, would ensure that neither side profited from a windfall on termination, and would result in a good agreement that protected and served both parties at the table. I not mean to say that there were not at times, uh, times when the proverbial gauntlet was thrown down, it was, by both sides, but we worked through those issues, compromised here and there, agreed on occasion, and I'm very pleased actually to bring you the draft that we have here this evening. Um, and we need a new agreement because the existing agreement was executed in 1977 with a term of 49 years that's terminating in 2026, a mere eight years from now. This agreement addresses myriad issues that were unknown or became unclear over the course of the last 41 years. So now I'll go through a presentation on the agreement. I want to be clear on all aspects so this PowerPoint is longer than Commissioner Bernardo's preferred six slides. <laughs> Starts out very general and then I get into very detail, uh, into specific detail as we go through the agreement. <clears throat> Turn it on. There we go. So the discussions have been ongoing uh, since the last committee meeting, that's the Oyster Point Joint Liaison Committee meeting in April of this year. Uh, we provided an update on uh, several issues related to Oyster Point to this commission in July of this year. Uh, at a special meeting around Oyster Point uh, in early October this year, and we agendized this for further discussion at the October 17th meeting, but it was not heard. The focus on the agreement was protection for both the district and the city, the need for flexibility to address changing conditions, and uh, it doesn't need uh, stating, but of course, anything that uh, staff are bringing forward is subject to Harbor Commission and, and City Council approval. So now just a, a very brief sort of point-by-point -point comparison. The old agreement term was 49 years. This new agreement, the initial term is 15 years and there are two 10-year options uh, to renew. Uh, the old agreement, responsibilities regarding sea level rise, uh, was silent. Uh, the new agreement says that the city is responsible for protection against sea level rise. Subsidence, 
The old agreement was silent on landfill subsidence. The new agreement says that the city is taking responsibility for landfill subsidence. Water quality in the marina. Uh, the old agreement is silent. The new agreement, uh, the city is taking overarching responsibility for that. I get, when I get into the detail of the agreement, I'll come up with some of the little caveats and the carve-outs in all of those categories that further qualify some of them, but those are the fundamental points. Uh, in particular, the old agreement was unclear on uh, general uh, maintenance of the facility. The new agreement is clear with operational performance indicators and uh, reciprocal default provisions should either side not uh, meet up to their obligations under this. Uh, we recognize that even in a shorter term 15-year agreement, you know, that will uh, only in fact extend seven years past the termination of the current agreement, that situations change. So this agreement embeds in it an opportunity for the city manager and the district general manager to work out and to collaborate on maintenance such that um, we're not having two restroom crews, for example, uh, maintaining their restrooms and our restrooms, we'll work out a, an efficient way that is most cost effective for the public and uh, meets our maintenance needs. Um, the Harbour Master Road is this road out here. The site elevation is being increased all through here up to about here. Uh, eventually this will need to be uh, raised up. Um, that is specifically called out as being a responsibility of the city to do that. The Which section can you, I mean for most people they probably couldn't tell what you were looking okay. at. Okay. So the, the work that's currently going on will come to about here. Sorry for the shaking. <laughs> come to about here, and then it sort of feathers into the lower elevation that is out to here. And at some point in the future, the city will come in and raise the elevation from here out to the end of the spit. Uh, the old agreement was silent on that. Um, the marina facilities, the new agreement is, is clear that the marina facilities themselves, the dogs are, are district responsibility. Well, you didn't mention the harbor master's office. What's the deal with that? Okay, I'll come into a little detail. The Harbour Master's Office, for those who don't know, is right out here. And um, the agreement specifically addresses the future of the Harbour Master's Office. The um, city uh, is taking the position that if they spend the millions of dollars necessary to improve this out here, then maybe this is, should be some greater public benefit than just having the Harbour Master's Office there. The way the re agreement uh, reads, is that if they require us to move, um, they will provide us with suitable accommodations elsewhere for the Harbour Master's Office. And uh, if they want to relocate the building, that will be done at their sole cost. That uh, there is a possibility for a joint use, such that we may reduce the uh, staffing presence there and uh, have some sort of interpretive uh, facility there. But um, uh, we've identified it as an issue and uh, identified some of the options and identified the responsibilities. But fundamentally, if we have to move from there, um, it's the city's responsibility to find us a place and move the building. Um, we have said in our discussions of what is a suitable, what are suitable accommodations is that we need eyes on the water. If we're going to be a harbor master's office, we need eyes on the water. That is, in fact, probably the best place for the Harbour Master's Office, um, but uh, we can, uh, it's, it's open to discussion and any final resolution of that would be uh, subject to council and, and uh, commission approval. While you're in that section, could you explain the, um, the deal with the responsibilities for the um, remainder parcel? The remainder parcel is through here. This is going to be improved by the, um, by the developer. And I've got a map that will come up at the end of this presentation that shows how we're dividing responsibilities. Uh, but it's currently the district's. Currently, currently the district, but there's really not much to be done down here. Currently, even though um, um, we did hear something um, about uh, the beach at this end uh, at that strategic planning meeting and that has been communicated uh, 
I believe, to the city. And the parcel, does it go all the way to the water, or where? What? What? It's unclear to me what the remainder parcel. I don't have is. the parcel map on this presentation, but basically there were parcels. Um, there was a parcel. Well, this is one of the E parcels. There were B parcels over here, C parcels up in here, remainder parcels. These parcels all got conveyed to the developer. This parcel is retained by. Uh, the city for uh, development of a hotel facility. This parcel is uh, public space. So the hotel is not planned to touch on the remainder parcel? I don't believe so. Because I heard that it was. I, all right. I heard that there was a plan to build a hotel on our remainder parcel. It's not our remainder parcel. Well, it's part of our... No, I'll show you the, the map at the end, but basically at the end of the day, um, we are responsible for basically this, like this. Right? All of this, all of this, all of this. But wasn't the, the city is responsible for all of this. Wasn't, isn't the remainder parcel part of our... The JPA? The yeah. property is controlled by the JPA? Yeah. Property is controlled by the JPA. Steve, jump in if I'm misremembering. The property is controlled by the JPA. Some of them were removed from the JPA in the implementation agreement in 2017. Um, I can see you. Uh, I would have to get back to I, you on specifically uh, where the boundaries are yes. under the current situation. But what you said is correct that under this proposed draft agreement, the district's operating and maintenance obligations are exclusively the water side and the east land side and not anything west of the spit. So we're giving up the remainder parcel as part of this MOU draft? Um, I, 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 I'm not sure that's the way I would characterize it, but I'd have to look at the existing agreement to see because exactly where the boundaries that's are. That's what I was told, here. so I want to get clarity on that. Well, again, if the, well, let's put it like this. If the remainder parcel is over here, and we don't know, we can't tell you at this point specifically and exactly where the boundaries are, the remainder parcels, and I believe there were two of them, are sort of linear parcels along the water's edge. Um, in this new agreement, those would not be within our control. This would be within our control. So we're, the agreement proposes that we get rid of the remainder part, that we, we give away the remainder parcels who is taking them? Is it the developer or the city that's the taking city. them? So the they're city. Not, they're not part of the developer's uh, land. So correct. we would, in this in this proposed agreement, we would be relinquishing the remainder parcels to the city. Again, I, I, I do think that without parcel maps, I, wouldn't, I mean, I, I wasn't prepared for this question. If I had been, I would be. Without the parcel maps and a, a read of the 2017 agreement, uh, the implementation agreement, again, I mean, I think the most simple way I can say it is that if it's on the west side of a line about here, it's the city's or the developer's, and if it's on the east side, it's ours. And if that can, is interpreted as we're giving up a remainder parcel or that a remainder parcel is well, yeah, maybe I, I ask it. Let me ask it this way. This okay. might be easier. How much square footage is in the remainder parcels that we would be like relinquishing back to the city? I don't know. So we don't know how much space we're actually losing in this draft agreement. How much physical no. real estate? Well, not on a square foot basis. No. Um, can I do that one? Oh, yeah. So those are the those are the general overarching um, principles of the uh, that we uh, uh, staff agreed to. I want to thank uh, the director of operations, John Moran, who was uh, sitting at the table through the majority of these conversations. Again, uh, Steve how, Miller. How many of these meetings were there? Just to give us a rough idea, because this is. All there was there was multiple conference calls and uh, around the table meetings. Um, Roughly uh, half a dozen. Six. 
I don't want to be held to that, but yeah. Six, roughly. Maybe, maybe. If, depending, if we go back to February 2017, when we kick this off, it would be more. Like 12? Maybe, yeah. And John Warren, how many of those meetings were you at, of those round table 12 to 6 meetings? I'm just trying to get a lay of the land here, because you're going to be yeah. taking over soon. How many of those meetings did you attend? I attended two of the uh, Oyster Point Liaison Committee meetings, and then Steve brought me in uh, on several of the other uh, <coughs> negotiation meetings most recently with uh, the city of South San Francisco. Uh, my lar largely as director of operations, uh, my role was to um, address issues of the, the directly impact operations. Uh, you know, like any negotiation, I think, the general manager and council uh, was, uh, was leading the negotiations with the city manager of South San Francisco. Well, since you were there, do you know how much square footage we'd be losing and relinquishing the remainder parcels? I'm just trying to get an understanding of the lay of the land here. What What's changing? I'm afraid without looking at the parcel maps, um, I just have a rough idea of what was in the past called a remainder parcel. Okay, so you're not sure? No, I'm, okay. I'm not aware. Again, uh, thanking Steve Miller for his small C and large C council. Large C council. Um, city Manager Mike Futrell, Assistant City Manager Marion Lee, and uh, also the City Attorney uh, Jason Rosenberg. Uh, thanks to all of them all put in good work uh, on, this, on this agreement. Now, um, I could start going through the agreement, uh, section by section, relevant section or, or important material section by section, but I do want to um, discuss uh, a couple of things. Um, well, could, I, I hate to interrupt, but is there any way we could take just a couple minutes? Because I really need a bathroom break. Sure. And I don't want to miss this. So, I really so want to see it. Um, 757. Do you want to do it? Yeah, that's fine. Right. 805? Yeah. Okay. I mean, thank you.
Okay. Okay. We've overextended our break by seven minutes. It is eight twelve, so we are going to reconvene and uh, um, have the discussion for item twenty, which is the Oyster Point Marina and Park potential new agreement with South San Francisco. So, Steve, thank you for your presentation. Um, we, I am happy to open I, this. Oh, please. I'm very sorry to say this, but I've only just begun. Oh, <laughs> then by all means, continue. All right. So what I will do, I will, I will reorder my thoughts. Uh, let me say just a couple of things. During the process of negotiating this agreement, the Finance Committee requested that we commission a report on uh, the finances of uh, Oyster Point. We contracted with Dornbush, and Dornbush came back at the end of the day with a report that uh, had two fundamental findings. The first was that the term of any new agreement should be at minimum 30 years in order to recover, to have an opportunity to recover the cost of the investment in uh, the capital facilities, because we know that some of the facilities there are past their useful life. Uh, they did the analysis and believed that at a 30-year term, uh, investment in new facilities would pay for themselves and develop a reserve for their replacement at the end of their useful life. The other uh, recommendation that they had was that the district uh, ensure that there was a termination provision in the new agreement that would allow for the payment to the district by the city of the depreciated value of any of the assets and that this would uh, give the district reassurance of its ability to invest in new facilities without providing a windfall agreement, a, w a windfall for the city on termination, that we would be paid the depreciated value of those assets. They further stated that if that agreement was in place, that the term of the agreement became less important because we would be uh, compensated for the depreciated value of an asset. And what I mean by that is if we build a dock for a million dollars and it's got a 30-year life, after 15 years it has a $500,000 value. If the agreement terminates in 15 years, then the city would pay us that depreciated value. But on the schedule of depreciation, we would never realize that $500,000. We would realize it over time. So the depreciation payment by the city would occur over time similarly. Uh, again, so Dornbush recommended the 30-year term and a straight-line depreciation on our assets on termination. Um, this agreement incorporates both of those things. The agreement term is 15 years initially with uh, two 10-year extensions for a total of 35 years. Uh, those extensions occur automatically unless uh, either side takes action to terminate them, which action must be initiated at least two years prior to the end of the term to give time for an orderly transition. And the agreement explicitly includes the formula to be used to determine the uh, net present value of any of the district's assets. Um, so that we would put a new dock in place, we would say this dock has a 30-year life, that it uh, um, uh, cost a million dollars, uh, after five years, it's five times uh, $33,000 a year, it's decreased in value by that much. So that is in the new agreement. I have a question about that. Yes. Um, so just so I understand, based on that reimbursement um, and the termination segment of the agreement, if the agreement was terminated, say, early next year, um, it would seem that that would trigger the city demanding that they receive the million dollars, how many millions of dollars in docs are we agreeing to in this agreement? To, to in, in future, prospectively? Uh, it per, um, sorry. Per the agreement, there's a section in the agreement that talks about replacing docks 12, 13, and 14. We'll endeavor to do that by the end of 2024, and we estimate those costs to $5 million. Okay, so it would seem that at that point, that would trigger the city to say, well, you guys agreed to this 
five million dollar investment because that's essentially all we're really technically agreeing to the way I read it and correct me if I'm wrong you guys have to pay the five million dollars and put these docks in before you know we're okay with the termination at which point then we could turn around and say okay fine we'll put in the five million dollar docks but you have to reimburse us for their useful life which is almost the full amount so that's my understanding well, well the first thing is that there's no provision in this agreement for terminating this agreement early next year well there is you can give notice to terminate this agreement with 300 and how many days 365 um, do you remember that? during the first there's two types of, yes. of termination rights right Thank there's you. termination for cause and there's termination for convenience as presently drafted during the initial base term of the agreement there is no rights for termination for convenience. There is only termination for cause, and cause is defined as the other party breaching their obligations under the agreement. The termination for convenience happens at the uh, moments in time when the contract terms are up for renewal, so two years before the initial base term, or two years before each tenure term, there are off-ramps to terminate for convenience. Um, but there is no such termination for convenience right during the initial base term. The 15 years. That's correct. Right. But if, if the board decided that they wanted to get out of the agreement, regardless of the 15 years, and it then went into arbitration, that as far as damages go, the damages to the city would be that they would want their $5 million docks. So it's very hard to predict with any certainty what would happen. The way we tried, there were the, 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 the way the agreement is drafted um, sets forth some guiding principles, um, which is that in the case of termination for convenience, neither party should get any kind of disproportionate benefit out of this project. And that in the, but in the case of termination for cause, um, the non-terminating party may have damages and may seek to recover those damages um, through arbitration, provided that the arbitrator's authority is limited, that the damages cannot be uh, punitive, and they can't result in any recovery that is disproportionate to the default. Now, that is a ambiguous statement, but it does provide some scope on the ability of the arbitrator to um, ex ex extract damages, but it's, it's, as you are recently familiar, it is hard to predict how an arbitrator will react. It depends on the nature of a breach, it depends on the nature of a default, um, but the agreement does contemplate both the recovery of all the money we, the district will have paid through this depreciation formula, and also acknowledges that a non-breaching party may have damages that they can submit a claim for for arbitration. Um, it's anything further than that would be sort of speculative as to what those damages could be. It's hard to predict. Okay, so it, it's, it, okay. we don't know what would happen, but it sounds like uh, it, it probably wouldn't be a huge financial hit because the money would be coming back through uh, the fact that the docks, if built, were are practically new. If um, you, if I, I don't want to offer assurances one way or another as to what the damages would be, to be clear. Uh, you're contemplating terminate, you're, you're contemplating breaching an agreement before you have decided to enter into an agreement, which is not generally a good attitude in which to enter into an agreement. So, um, well, you always want to contemplate worst case scenario. It's wise to do that. And so it makes sense okay, so to play out that scenario. The, the, to the, worst, fullest. the worst case scenario is that uh, the non breaching party will seek to recover all the damages that the non-breaching party thinks they are entitled to. And it's a little hard to speculate what those might be because it depends on lots of things, things. we don't know right now. Got it, thank you. Yeah. So, um, well, let's 
go into the agreement itself. This is on page 20-47 of your board package, um, and it starts off with uh, recitals. And basically the recitals are a statement of facts. Here's what's on the ground, and here's what we want to achieve, um, here's some of the history. Steve, page 20 is exhibit A, which is blank, which is, I think, supposed to be a map. It's of attachment the property. two. It's attachment two, twenty dash forty seven on the bottom of attachment two. Oh, yeah. Exhibit yeah. A is a nice kind is of, the nice map. Yes. Do you have attachment yeah. two? Did we get that map? No, I don't have a map. I, 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 okay. What what it's go back in the agreement twenty dash forty seven. No, I know, but in the packet it's attachment two. Attachment two. Yeah. It's attachment two. So is there a map? There's a map in the presentation that appears that it may have been left out of the board package. So why don't you put it go to the presentation? Okay, okay. I'll, all right, I'll do that. But so we didn't get the map. You had the map in the last board package. There it is. That's Exhibit A. That's Exhibit A. Could we get copies of those? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Debbie. Um, all right. So while um, Debbie's getting that, we we'll go back and work through this. So does, the, does that map show the, um, the re remainder parcels? No, it does not, because the remainder of these, the property descriptions that describe the various parcels, parcels A, B, C, D, E, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and remainder parcels, uh, those uh, lot lines and uh, parcel definitions have gone away as part of the implementation agreement to a certain extent. Again, going back to the earlier discussion, to uh, I don't have those parcel maps uh, uh, at hand. Um, so the recitals um, talks about how the 1977 JPA goes away. The 2011 MOU agreement stays. That's the one that is. Um, established certain rights for the district uh, and looked at uh, the weta payment, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, when the ferry terminal was constructed, the 2017 implementation agreement stays. That's the one that cleaned up some of the things that were left out of the 2011 agreement and addressed payment by the community facilities district for the fueling system. I, I have a quick question about the 2011 agreement. Okay. So with, because I didn't, I'm thank you for pointing out that the 2011 agreement stays. Isn't that the agreement that um, says that the city of South San Francisco is entirely responsible for the sewer system? In as much as the elements of the 2011 agreement are not superseded by the um, uh, this proposed agreement, um, I think it's fair to say that two, I don't recall the 2011 agreement having a sewer system in it. Um, I, could I know be the wrong, 1977 agreement the, was vague at best. The, I, sorry, go ahead. Go, no, no, if you know. The 2011 agreement, uh, I don't believe, has anything to do with the sewer obligations of sewer systems. The existing JPA under which the parties are operating. Um, Where is the 2011? Is that in our packet? It's, in the it's on the it's website. The I think it was in the previous packet. Um, it's no. Because I, I just want to check it for that because I thought that people knew it. No, it's not. A, it's not attached to this staff report. It, it has. It, it does not speak to the. Sewer system. The sewers. The responsibilities for sewer under the existing JPA are, um, you know, everything you say about the existing JPA. You have to give the caveat that it's unclear and difficult to read. But for the most part, places the responsibility for operating and maintaining the sewer system on the district, not on the city. That's not my recollection. Okay. 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 Can we get? We need. I, we definitely need to get clear on that tonight. So, if you guys can please show me where, because my understanding was the city was responsible for the sewer, and I want to know where it says that we've been responsible for the sewer. 
the one of the fundamental goals of this agreement, as Steve just said, it, it, is that that 1977 agreement simply did not um, address many issues that we want to address. Uh, it did not clearly state uh, who was responsible for various aspects of the management and maintenance of the uh, land side of the marina. And uh, I think our staff and city staff have been doing an outstanding job of absolute clear direction in any written document and cooperating on making sure that the facilities are maintained. Um, and uh, what this agreement says specifically to the sewer system is that all the sewer mains are the responsibility, the sewer main is the responsibility of the city and all the sewer laterals are responsible uh, in the district's control property, which is at the east end. The laterals are a responsibility of the district. So sure, for just for what it's worth, the language in the existing JPA says all sewer and water services, and this is the language that is governing the uh, relationship as it exists today, all sewer and water services, including sewer lines, interceptor lines, lift stations, and water mains of a size sufficient to meet fire flow and service demands necessary to service the project shall be re the responsibility of the district. <coughs> That is not what this proposed arrangement is. That's what's in the, the JPA. I, I just thought there was an agreement that that was after that agreement <coughs> that then made the sewer the responsibility of the city, and that's what I'm trying to figure out. What's the what's the number? I'm I have a, I have most of these documents, so I'm looking for the 2011 MOU. Um, I see a 2009 MOU. Is that yeah. a different MOU? Yeah, that was superseded by the 2011 MOU. I don't know if I have the 2011 MOU. It's on the district's website. So, is it? Uh, yes. it is, it is. Okay, so can we, I know that you have a lot of questions, Sabrina, but can we just kind of get <coughs> through the presentation so that we can ask oh, oh, thank questions you. in general as a whole? Because I have like 10 public comment cards, which is going to take. 30 minutes um, at least, probably, if, if other people, I'm going to try to leave public comment open as long as possible. I'm not trying to cut you off, but I want to I want to hear some more of them on this so that maybe some of our questions can be answered. Steve? Okay. Um, so, again, those are the recitals on page three. Page four, start talking about the uh, actual uh, agreement the term uh, as I said initial term 15 years automatic renewal for two additional 10 year terms unless there's default by the party or the choice of either party not to renew the choice of either party not to renew is required two years prior to any of these renewal terms to allow for uh, an orderly transition even uh, if there's a situation of default and the uh, defaulting party has been given an opportunity to cure and it's still not been cured, that unless we agree otherwise, the uh, default takes, uh, uh, the, the default notice is 365 days. There's a year or two years notice. There's no, um, uh, there's no, uh, don't show up tomorrow. Sort what does that mean? I'm confused by that. Confused by what, Commissioner Brennan? Well, the, how much notice is there supposed to be? Is it two years or is it? It all depends on whether it's default or convenience. If it's convenience, it's two years. If it's default, it's one year. Um, there's a section that talks about docs 12, 13, and 14. These are highlighted on the presentation here. These are the easterly end and have been identified by the district as the most in need of repair, uh, are in most in need of replacement. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you just asked me. Where is the 2011? Because it's not here. It's on the district's website. So it's on the district's I'm website? On the district's Let me show you. Steve. Um, do you want to show? Commissioner Brennan, because I really want to get through yeah, this presentation. Yeah, I know. I'm talking about the... Uh, the <laughs> don't go to Oyster Point Marina site. Go to the district's website. Oh, I just thought we were going to go to staff. And go to Oyster Point Marina. Just click on Oyster Point Marina. 
And then scroll down. And there are all the JPA documents. Okay. So the agreement says that we will um, take reasonable effort to replace DOFs 12, 13, and 14 by the end of 2024 uh, at an estimated uh, cost of five million dollars. <coughs> then at the other end of the marina we've got docks one through six. These are in um, uh, marginally better condition than docks 12, 13, and 14. By the way, uh, dock 11 here is brand new and for those not familiar we've got docks one through six, dock seven which is a uh, under license to a, a commercial activity permit holder uh, we skip to dock 11 because docks, uh, this is dock 8, the guest dock, docks 9 and 10 were replaced by the, um, the, uh, the uh, ferry, ferry terminal. terminal. So we've got docks 1 through 6, um, that by the end of 2023 we'll uh, study those docks and prepare a plan for the commission. And if replacement hasn't begun by 2024, uh, we'll commission a new study to determine what we should do with DOTS 1 through 6 prior to the re renewal, commencement of the renewal term uh, of the agreement. On page 5, section 4, C, D, and E, um, this is obligations of the district. We'll operate and maintain the marina area and the east land side. So, this, basically. Okay. Um, we, uh, it includes uh, relevant parcels, portions of the Westland side. We've got some restrooms down here that are tenant restrooms that will be responsible for managing those. The district general manager and city manager will work out deals to try to make sure we're using the public's money in the most efficient manner possible. We'll maintain access out to the harbor master's office and we'll meet the operational performance indicators. I'll come to those in a minute. These are attempts at trying to, to define what it means to reasonably operate and maintain the marina. Um, we'll continue to execute leases. Uh, we'll consult with the city because the city should be consulted if they're the uh, underlying fee property owner and we may not be there forever. And uh, the agreement calls for city approval if the agreement, if the lease that we want to execute is longer than 10 years. <coughs> so we retain all the operating revenues from those. The obligations of the city will provide sewer, police, and fire. Now the sewer we just talked about, it's going to provide the sewer main, we're going to provide the sewer laterals. We'll maintain and manage the sewer laterals. What are laterals? sewer laterals? Hmm? A, su a sewer lateral goes from a sewer main, uh, it tees off or branches off a sewer main to a specific property. So like how many, like other, how many sewer laterals are on there? Um, will there be one to uh, the shop, one to the yacht club? Uh, there's probably one running through here to this facility. There are laterals out to the restrooms. What, what about, um, are there laterals to any of the docks? No. Okay, and what about electrical? Electrical. Who is responsible for, because we there's underground electrical which has been flooding there. Who is responsible for the... Well, that's all getting, in, in West Side, that's all getting replaced. Uh, Jim right. and John are here, correct me if I'm wrong on that. And that's the area where we've been having the inundation. And that's all getting raised in elevation. And what about the elect, who's responsible for the electrical under the landfill on the area where we're responsible? Uh, I mean, I, where we're managing. We would be responsible for that because we put it in. And it's uh, all, uh, there's a main feed and everything is on a sub feed from that main feed. One drop to PG&E. Keep looking at Jim, Jim's nodding, so I'm getting it right so far. Um, and so uh, if it's on the PG&E side of that main feed, it's PG&E. And if it's on our side of the PG&E uh, uh, drop, it's ours. Okay. Okay. Keep going. So obligations to the city. They'll operate the marine west side land area. Are, um, are there any, just so I understand, are there any, 
is there any awareness at this time of any problems with the sewer laterals? There, it's an odd system. Uh, most systems will uh, either pump or gravity feed to a lift station and then to another lift station until it gets to the wastewater treatment facility. Our system is a vacuum system, so rather than push, it pulls the material. Um, I think the vac station is aging. Is that fair? Um, the sewer laterals, I'm not aware of any specific problems with sewer laterals themselves. They're, they're not typical laterals, so the system's always under a vacuum. Yes. There's always a pressure in the system in the east basin. Yes. So the west basin, so in the development area, that's all force main. Yes. So it's all gravity feed into a force main. Mm -hmm. When I say force main, the gravity feeds into uh, lift stations, and then from the lift station, it force mains to the city. It, it's and pushed it's under pressure. Where you go east basin, it's all done with suction. Yes. So the lines all stay clear all the time, and we've uh, we've camered those lines. There's no buildup in them. They're all PVC, so there's no deterioration or anything okay. like that. There's some differential settling that that's occurred, but that when those lines were put in, they actually offset those lines to have some differential settling. So as that mm -hmm. affluent was brought through, any of the solids would hit these these changes in elevation and help to break it up before it got to what we consider our vac station. In the vac station, there's a giant tank that always has a pressure, a vacuum on it, between 15 and 20 pounds. And there's a float valves, or float switches inside that. Once it gets to a certain level, then it force mains to the city's pumps. So that's how that system works. It's an older system. It was rebuilt by myself and our staff in 2004, we put all new valves in and stuff like that. Pumps have been rebuilt once since in, in my tenure there. Um, controls have all been replaced. Um, is it the best system in the world? No. Does it work? Yeah. And are there any requirements to improve the landfill cap when we <coughs> dig in to address infrastructure issues such as sewer and the electrical and things like that like i know that there's the new cap requirement um that that is triggered the recapping of the landfill on the south san francisco project side which you're calling which part what are you calling that area yes the, the east basin, basin. Um, so in, in the east basin just to get this clear there's been no um um high tide inundation or in, in, the, in the East Basin, uh, a slight bit down at the Dock 14 area and at the launch ramp, but we've had no issues with um, electrical or sewer problems due to uh, tidal inundation. Um, there are some mitigations that were proposed for the landfill uh, uh, capping that were in the East Basin. I don't know if those are gonna happen or not. They were out on the South Shore line where this thing's pointing now. That is, that is going to happen by the contractor for part of the work that's currently going on. Get in and repair cap in this area. But I guess the question is, like, if we went and talked to the water board and we told them that we were going to be doing a project to replace, say, the sewer laterals or the electrical, would they then come back to us and say, okay, fine, but you've got to recap the landfill up to modern day standards. You can't just do the same thing that was done initially which wasn't a um, doesn't meet the EPA standards or whatever the water board standards are for landfill caps today. I'm just wondering what the what the responsibilities are for addressing the cap. So typically the utilities that we found have not been in the garbage when we've had to do a repair or something when we haven't done them up. They are above the clay cap and we've been able to repair them in house. We haven't had to penetrate that clay cap. I know when uh, WIDA did the construction there. They penetrated the clay cap to put in some of their utilities, and I don't know what the specs were for them to replace. But, but they, um, didn't, they didn't have to come into the whole East Basin or the East Land side and repair everything. The wetter work that's correct. Uh, extended from about here to uh, replace it out like that. Well, that's kind of in the East Basin. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. They didn't have to do the East Land side. So that part hasn't been brought to modern day cap requirements. Mm -hmm. 
the only cap repair needed to were where was in this area, and the developers paid for that. But I thought the water board said that they wanted the whole thing recapped eventually. I haven't heard that. Nothing they said. I haven't heard that. <laughs> okay. Um, obligations of the city again. Uh, if the district is required to vacate this our master's office, the city will provide us with simple space. The city is solely responsible for protecting against sea level rise, landslide inundation, protecting against inundation caused by landfill subsidence, uh, for correction, corrective actions necessitated by subsidence, unless we've done something dumb like, um, I, I can't even imagine what it would be. Um, and the, this, the city is solely responsible for meeting any of the standards in this area that are imposed by other agencies. If there is any sort of concurrent uh, responsibility to determine if, um, then we would need to confirm how that worked out. Um, the uh, obligations of both parties, uh, the district general manager and city manager will meet regularly, prepare an annual report, will maintain com and manage compliance with the operational performance indicators, and will share with the maintenance when it's the most efficient thing to do. Um, the district for water quality, I mentioned generically that the city is taking responsibility for water quality in the marina. We're responsible for our actions and those of our tenants. Um, this is the sort of thing where maybe a bilge pump uh, kicks on and spills already water into the marina. This is the sort of thing that does happen. Uh, our staff are trained and have the equipment to get in there with uh, building pads and booms and then uh, build the cost of that back to the uh, owner. Uh, and then either the owner, if the owner is present, or the district will manage all of the notifications uh, to their appropriate agencies. Um, page 8 talks about governance that will each establish standing committees and will meet jointly to a minimum receive uh, an annual report. Um, Indemnification again on, on page eight. Uh, mutual indemnifications with the city indemnifying the district for sea level rise and subsidence. Page nine. Because of, I mean, I think this is one of the more, of course, very hard to, when this is all under development and there's heavy equipment moving around, the elevation is changing on, on a daily basis.
to the other party, at which point the party can either have a 30-day period to fix a problem if they agree there's a problem, or if it disputes that there is a, a problem with, uh, uh, you know, we don't agree on what the right standard is for operating and maintenance of the property, the party claiming a problem can uh, commission a study from an independent third party expert agreed to by both sides who will uh, issue an opinion as to whether or not the party is in fact maintaining the property properly or not. So that uh, iterative process has to occur before one party can claim that the other party is actually in default of the agreement for failure to operate and maintain the property. So it's uh, done our best to create a, a situation in which disputes can get resolved informally, but there's a mechanism for a third party to weigh in if necessary, all before uh, a, a breach of the agreement. Um, the, the, the Trails of Public Areas in Good Repair, the Stormwater has a SWIP, a Stormwater <coughs> Pollution Prevention Plan. Um, it's their responsibility to maintain compliance with that SWIP. Um, the district is currently, the, the marina is currently certified as a clean marina. Uh, this is a certification by an independent third party that gets renewed every five years. Same is true for Bill Point Harbor. Both of our facilities are clean marinas. Um, and this is uh, another example of where we can come in. We can come in with an objective, uh, data-driven uh, operational performance indicator. Whenever we could, we, did, we used one. Um, the actual language says district to maintain clean marina certification or equivalent equal. We don't know, for example, that in 10 years, uh, the clean marina hasn't program hasn't morphed into some different name or something else. So we just want to make sure that um, we continue to do our best efforts at maintaining an environmentally responsible uh, uh, facility, which is what we have done. Um, uh, that was, um, that's actually a, a holdover, I'm sorry, from the uh, October meeting, but we didn't discuss it. Uh, but the next steps, um, if the board approves this this evening, uh, will be for the city council to uh, take a look at it. And uh, once the city council has taken a look at it, um, as long as there are no material changes, uh, we would execute the agreement and any material changes, we'd come back to the board for uh, further discussion. I think that the, um, um, the alternatives to not doing this, uh, this point are um, the 1977 agreement is not a has, has got so many holes in it this is an agreement that uh, actually just extends seven years beyond the end of the current uh, JPA it provides clarity uh, in so many areas where the 77 agreement <coughs> is silent it provides more than anything else a way to terminate the agreement the 1977 agreement didn't have that. So if we were just to write out the next eight years, it would, I think, get very, quite messy when we um, went to try to figure out how to terminate that agreement. Um, and I think more than anything else, this agreement shows the city and the district working cooperatively to, again, as I said at the beginning, uh, serve the public with uh, good facilities that will be improved and maintained uh, into the future, and that uh, we're in a position to do that, to do this. We have uh, incorporated the recommendations of the Dornbush report um, and uh, tried to address uh, every eventuality that we can think of and try to put in place languages, language or procedures to address those issues that we aren't aware of uh, or haven't yet become aware of. So uh, I think this is a good roadmap forward uh, and uh, protects the district. Uh, and again, we went into it with a goal not to try to um, beat the city or, or the city beat the district, but to come up with something that we could both, as public agencies, um, take with pride to our respective legislative bodies 
and say this is a good agreement, we recommend it. Uh, so that's what your staff are doing today, and that's what we hope the city staff can do in, uh, at a future city council meeting. I, I just have a clarifying question about the staff report, because in the staff report you mentioned um, the recommendation in the Dornbush report that the district consider the option to transition to a management agreement where the district would be paid a small fee by the city of South San Francisco to manage um, Oyster Point Marina and the city would bear the costs of uh, maintaining things like infrastructure such as sewer and so whatever and also um, uh, you know pay for the capital improvement projects since they're improving their property not property that we own and so I know you mentioned that in the staff report and you keep talking about the Dornbush report but you haven't mentioned okay. that there was that recommendation that we look at that and I know the board had asked had asked staff had asked yeah. you to uh, to do that and and we haven't been shown any sort of draft agreement as a management right. agreement option which is what we had asked for well there was no draft agreement created of a management contract because the city wouldn't entertain it it would have been a completely one-sided agreement uh, if there's no cooperation going into it uh, i'm not sure that the effort would be worthwhile the Dornbush report at the end of it says specifically in the absence of the public revenue currently allocated um, uh, to uh, the harbor district by the county south city would not find this to be an attractive proposition what that basically is saying is that oyster point marina has both what we term public and enterprise functions we have uh, a search and rescue capability there we participate in uh, joint exercises with multiple uh, local, state, and federal agencies on a regular basis uh, to be able to efficiently respond to uh, major disasters on the water. Uh, uh, those efforts on by our staff are led by Jim, most, and, and Matt is here as well, and most recently uh, we participated in the multi-agency Operation Poseidon uh, on the bay. But that's not talking about well, the well, management agreement. I'm, 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 what I'm trying to do is lay the groundwork for why a management agreement uh, uh, is not an attractive option for the city, and we couldn't get any traction with that idea. So did they so, reject the idea? Yes. How did that transpire? Could you give us the background? We is brought up the idea. Explained? They basically said they, they, the staff were simply not willing to entertain that. So, here, here, because here's the issue. we have been uh, operating this from, since 1977, and we operated with both the enterprise funds and our existing stream of public revenues, our tax dollars. Uh, those tax dollars uh, have been paying for this search and rescue function, these public functions, the public functions we've been doing landside. And recently, after I got it, we started separating out our public and our enterprise funds both expenses and revenues, so that we could see exactly where uh, the money was coming from and going to. So we recognized that in the enterprise side of the shop at Oyster Point, uh, we actually uh, take in more operating revenue than we spend on operating expenses, absent capital costs. Um, in public, uh, we have about a, uh, a wash, but it's a little, we spend a little bit more on public than we allocate to Pillar Point out of um, our public revenues. Um, at the end of the day, and this is sort of mirrored at Pillar Point as well. So we've got an existing stream of money from enterprise revenue and from tax dollars that we feed into Oyster Point and allows us to move forward. I know, but we own and, and Pillar Point Harbor. I, I understand, different. I understand. If, if South City were to operate this, they would have that enterprise revenue stream that we currently have, but they would have to look around somewhere else to get that uh, public enterprise stream that we have baked into our, uh, uh, our way of doing business. They don't have that, so they don't, where would they get that money? We've got that money, we've been using that money for these public purposes. Um, uh, 
Most management contracts are between, a, for example, a public agency and a private company to operate a marina. Private companies don't do the public services that we do. I, I simply couldn't find an example of a management contract between two public entities because public entities aren't there to make a profit. They're there to provide good public service. We've got to be good financial stewards. We've got to be transparent and accountable. But we are there to provide the public service. The city is there to provide public service. This agreement is an example of a good way of the city and the district collaborating. You could look at this as, as fundamentally, we've got a ground lease from the city with no rent. I know, but a management agreement does provide the service, and that's, that's a great benefit. And our staff does a wonderful job managing the facility. Yes. So, I mean, that is a public service in itself. It's, yes. That's, that's a wonderful, generous public service that we are providing to the entire Bay Area and beyond. And we're paying for some of that with public revenues because we allocate public revenues to the public uh, costs associated so with this. And the city doesn't have that dedicated revenue stream. But the Dornish report shows that we are in the red. I mean, we are, it's the sub, all right, we all, we already know. So I'm going to, um, we have 10 public comment <coughs> slips. <coughs> and so I'm going to open it up to public comment. I just want to address the fact that there were two members of the public. I would normally read your emails, but we have a hard stop at 930, which we'll probably have to extend. Um, so one is from Mary Lorenis and one is from Nancy Ryer. And I don't know if these are in the back for people to see. They are? Okay, great. That's the main thing. So I'm going to open it up to public comment right now. Um, and the first person for this item, item 20, is Keith Mangold. Thank you, Keith. Hello, well, I'm a uh, uh, resident of Del Granada and I watch what's going on at the you know, mission. And uh, I have a, have a background in doing planning around strategic planning and you know, goal setting and all the rest of that. And, uh, could you speak up just a little bit sure. more? It's, uh, it's not been clear to me what the objectives were that drove the change in schedule, uh, moving it up eight years. I think I've heard a lot of discussion about sea level rise and subsidence and, you know, landfills. Landfill is a huge negative perceived liability on, over most of the world. Uh, probably more in England than we're seeing right now. But um, it would seem that the service that we're providing ultimately uh, to South San Francisco is our expertise and staff in maintaining their facility, basically. And granted, that's got a little murky with the ownership of some of the, the docks and all that. But isn't it possible just to do that? And, make all the rest of this stuff go away? I mean, all the land-based stuff just revert to their management or do it under a contract? And, and maybe the answer is that revenue stream you're talking about, but if we're running a deficit on that, is that in the best interest of the public? I don't know, it seems like there needs to be more transparency about this and uh, an indication of, of what that revenue stream actually looks like. I mean, I tend to get a little cynical about some of these things once in a while if, if I don't see a clear benefit for everyone. And right now, I, I'm not for the public, frankly. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mary Morenas. Thank you, Mary. It's on. It's on. I so I'm Mary Lorenis. I live in Moss Beach. It's on, or I just speak really loud. Um, you should have also received letters from Barbara Dye, Chris Lynn and Liang, and Sue Holly. But apparently, I'll make sure you get those, Virginia. So I'm asking that. You do not approve this agreement tonight. 
There are eight years left on the GPA, JPA before it lapses. There's no reason to move forward on this item without a chance for the public to have more of an opportunity to ask questions and gain full understanding where their taxpayer dollars are going. And the Harbor District, we're in the middle of a strategic planning process and in transition to a new interim general manager, as well as new board members with the election of Nancy Ryering. It would be prudent for the board to understand that this is not a time for making major decisions, such as to prevent this new agreement with South City. And when I listened to the presentation tonight, it all went very, sounded very la 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 and wonderful. But if you followed each item in the actual plan, the Doran Bush uh, record things that you guys have, it's a completely different thing. It's much less clear about where we're gonna benefit from this agreement. When I read things like under operations and maintenance that um, without written approval of the city can take action that directly or indirectly prevent or interfere that the city's expense and control of possession of the city. I mean, like all these certain things are just going on where how do we know exactly and clearly what you're saying? And it says, um, hang on, I gotta find it. Um, regarding the uh, shoot, regarding the Harbor District office, if the city goes ahead and maintains and improves the spit that goes out to the Harbor District office, they can then come in and tell the Harbor District they have to move. So what that tells me is the city's got an eye on that Harbor District office and they want to improve that spit, raise the ground so it's above sea level rise so they can go out and take that Harbor District office. Sure, they're gonna to have to find some other place for us to go, but in the meantime, they're gonna have this nice little setting out there that's gonna benefit the city, not the Harbor District. So there's lots of things, I'm sorry, Steve, as you went through this, it's way too fast, it's not detailed, there's so many things more that each one of these paragraphs that we need to really understand as the public. Otherwise, all you're doing is, you know, we're, you're obfuscating and subterfuging and Virginia received a letter from the women, uh, from lo the League of Women Voters about transparency. They wouldn't be very happy if they hear about what's going on tonight because this is anything but transparent. Thank you. That's okay, it happens all the time. Um, <laughs> so my name is Celine Jurakin, and I am a liverboard at Pillar Point. I've been living there for five years now. And I must say I'm a little bit jealous to see what's happening at Oyster Point and not at Pillar Point. Um, I wonder when was the last time you guys walked on the docks at Pillar Point, especially on A, B, and C docks, where my boat is on C dock. Um, we could definitely use $5 million to repair those docks. Um, when it's foggy and misty, and I know it's not the weather right now, but it's so slippery that I pretty much almost fall all the time. Um, the wood of the dock is shipping, and like it makes huge splinters, and you can just walk and fall too. Um, so that's just a couple of things that could definitely be um, fixed at Pure Point. But in the meantime, you want to spend all that money for Oyster Point, and it doesn't seem like it has to be done for the, like in the next seven years or eight years. Um, also, Exhibit D that you showed seemed a little bit overboard. Um, have you gone to the bathrooms or the showers at Pure Point? There is in the women's shower, for instance, the heater hasn't been working for a long time, and yet you see that everything will be fixed in 30 days for um, Oyster Point. So anyway, I just wanted to say that I feel like a lot of money could be wisely spent for the Pillar Point facility, and it's almost kind of 
leftover. And when you have to fix all of this for Oyster Point, what's gonna happen to Piro Point? Is the money gonna, the money that I pay for my rent, is it gonna go towards Oyster Point and fixing the faucets over there when we could definitely need some of that? Um, the, there is also, one of the exhibits was saying irrigation for landscape at Oyster Point when the entire area at Piro Point is cover of, covered of invasive species that could also be um, changed. So anyway, just wanted to raise that point and there's people like us who live on the dock and could definitely use some attention and improvement for the facilities. So. And, I, and I love the staff at the harbor at Piro Point. They're amazing. And there is so much they can do. If there is no money to fix a heater or to fix something, they're not, it's not going to happen. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for hearing me tonight, commissioners. Um, I'm a recreational boater, a competitive sailor. I've been on a bunch of local boards, including uh, Half Moon Bay Yacht Club, Shark Stewards, and I have a, some history with land use. I've been a city planner at one time. Um, I've read this entire contract, the JPA, the Dornbush uh, contract. Um, 1977 really isn't that long in terms of uh, contract length. You know, the U.S. Constitution is 229 years old. Um, this is a $308 million land purchase and a $2 billion uh, $2 billion project on there. Um, I see very little benefit from the contract proposed tonight. Um, there's a couple specific things I could look on there and say, um, uh, the Dornbush shows that we've got 1.8 million a year in operating revenue on there and, uh, and uh, roughly 70% of that is uh, personnel costs, personnel pension costs. And uh, over the lifetime of this contract, that's about $46.5 million that we're, as a county, are specifically putting into the city. Um, you know, in, in uh, regular land use, dry land use, uh, permanent modifications uh, stay with the property on there. And um, in terms of goals of preventing windfall, if you were to uh, move that to a nautical setting, and I'm not 100% sure you can, um, someone is definitely getting a windfall here, but it's, it's not San Mateo County Harbor District. Um, it's the city there. Um, Eight months, that's how long it took for uh, U.S. Army to bulldoze the cars off the Fukushima airport after that specific calamity. Um, I know there's different trauma events that, that make this contract move, but 30 days for a uh, Simtail County Harbor District to not operate that district is, is gosh, that's less than a month. And I, I can imagine about 15 different scenarios in which the uh, Harbor District may be financially legally many different reasons why uh, they might breach that 30 days and still be a good steward of that contract um, on a regular basis. Uh, I walked that entire project in the last week. I, I was at that marina using that and um, the uh, Sierra Point in Brisbane uh, as recently as, as July. Um, I think this contract does not benefit the uh, residents of the County of San Mateo. Thank you very much. Good evening, commissioners. My name is April Vargas, and I live in Montera. Um, as I've been following the discussion tonight, um, the first thing that I'm very aware of is that it's uh, Mr. McGrath's last night tonight, and it's Commissioner Bernardo's last night tonight. Um, the voters have spoken. They re-elected Commissioner Lorenis, and there will be a new commissioner sworn in in January. And I'm sure that there's uh, plans right now to hire a new general manager. So trying to get something as complicated as this, as far-reaching, with such financial consequences, finished tonight is unrealistic, and quite frankly, it's irresponsible. I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. This is a very complicated project, and there are so many ways in which things could either go wrong, be misconstrued, or end up in litigation, that it really needs to be looked at much more closely. Um, I understand that the city of San Francisco would certainly like to have the operations 
and all the maintenance work paid for by the harbor district, they won't have to pay for it. But what is the San Mateo County Harbor District going to get out of this? No agreement at all is not what I'm proposing right now, but it's got to be something that's more equitable, that the public understands and supports, and something that really is going to work over the terms of the contract. Um, asking how can we terminate this, on the one hand, yes, it could be negative thinking, but on the other hand, it's to think ahead if the Harbor District gets itself into a situation that turns out to be very bad and needs to be ended. So again, I applaud the work that everybody's put into this. We don't have to do it tonight. So I ask you please to continue this discussion and get more information before you make such an important decision. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John Owen. I have an audio to play for you, or I was going to, but uh, it's not going to work through this system. It'll screech everything. But that audio, will show, if you were to listen to it, will show you is that in 2015, Mr. M Mr. Futrell, well, the city of South Samson was discussing what, what they were then calling an amicable divorce, characterized the current <coughs> APA as being so, a document that relieved a horrible long-term liability from the bur and burden from the shoulders of the city. That means you assumed it. That's what the deal was for them. They wanted to um, uh, bail on the contract. They were considering going to the uh, LAFCO and uh, the county and filing to have you guys uh, dissolved. And uh, while there could be good arguments made for that, uh, the city uh, manager and uh, the more level-headed people on the board quickly shut that down because the Harvard District um, finances the operations and uh, subsidizes the operations out at, the Harvard, out at OPM and has for 20, 35, 40, 50 years, something like that. The city does not want a management agreement because they understand intrinsically it's not going to ever make them money or break even even. And I understand for them that's not the question, but you are an enterprise district. You would not take on any other project or uh, something like that without at least looking how you're supposed to break even and make money on the deal. And you have the Dornbush report, which basically shows that if you spend a bunch of money, raise the rents up out there for the people who are living, make it so 60 foot yachts can get into that place, if everything goes right for 20 or 30 years, you might break even. And that is not the kind of deal that a businessman would take, and it doesn't seem like it has anything in it for the city, even if everything works, or for the, the district, even if it all works out. And before I get too far and get, lose my time here, there is a huge problem floating over this whole thing. And Ms. Chankarali, you're the one who identified back in the day that this was going to happen probably. The CFD is not formed. This, without the CFD being formed, nothing can be done to repair the damp or the work that needs to be done out there at OPM. For example, Mr. McGraw tried to get the city of South San Francisco to agree to cover the cost should the, J uh, the CFD fail for $75,000 just to get the fuel dock uh, redesign going. Because as you all know, the fuel dock is a serious mess. It was identified even to have electrical hazards that could hurt people. Uh, there's a lot more to say, but uh, before you guys commit to something like this, you should look at that contract that they're proposing, and you'll see that there's no bailout for should the CFD fail. And the last thing bit, and I'll go, Friday's the next time they're going to have a hearing on this CFD issue, the, one of the people who owns property out there says they're not going to pay for it and they're taking it to court and it could last it could end Friday or it could last for years more or Kawishua could win on Friday and then what happens if you pass this tonight and Kawishua wins on Friday what happens you can't fix anything without the CFD thank you, thank you. so I have another card <coughs> 
Did you just want to, you want to mm -hmm. submit one? No, Keith. Did you submit two? Okay. So, okay. Uh, Neil Merrily. Um, before Mr. Merrily speaks, would the board entertain a motion to extend the meeting? Yes. Um, it is now 925, so is there a motion to extend the meeting to 945? I move that we extend the meeting to 945. Is there a second? A second. Okay, roll call please. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. President Shankarelli? Aye. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Neil? Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, this will be quick. Um, I don't think this proposal is ready. I think it needs uh, more public scrutiny. I just found out about this yesterday. Um, it, at first glance, just at the meeting tonight, it seems like it's a really good deal for South San Francisco, but I don't see the benefit for the taxpayers of San Mateo County. Um, and, you know, once you sign the agreement, uh, you're stuck. And you have a lot of power right now before you sign, and you have no power after you sign. And here's an example. Why would you agree to service, to, to be responsible for sewer laterals? You know, they're not your laterals. But what's South San Francisco going to do? Find another <laughs> agency to come in um, that would agree to that? I don't think very many people would. Um, and before you sign another agreement, shouldn't you have everything inspected? Shouldn't everything <clears throat> be required to be brought up to code? And um, I mean, you, you have that kind of power right now. You can, you can set the terms of the agreement. And I think, um, yeah, there were some things that were worse about the old agreement, but this agreement doesn't seem to be much better. I don't see the benefit for the general public um, for this proposal. Thanks. Thank you. Leonard Warren? Good evening. Uh, I'm going to try not to repeat things that other speakers have said, um, and I'll say that I, I pretty much agree with everything you've heard from the other speakers. Um, in a sense, this is a lame duck board, and uh, I, I want to give you a little bit of history. When I got elected in 1997, there were three of us who got elected. We took over the Grada Sanitary District Board. and. Um, on the lame duck agenda, there were a number of items that were controversial that were based on the things we campaigned on, and the outgoing board did the honorable thing, and they punted most of that agenda until we were in office. And the honorable thing for you to do would be to punt this off into January after the new commissioner is seated, after and, and I'm not clear on what your schedule is for the strategic plan, but you probably need to work on that some more. And um, I'm not going to have time to go into all of my notes, so I just want to read one thing out of the um, uh, staff report that Mr. McGrath didn't read. And so everything, everything that he said is smoke and mirrors to cover up this one particular point. Um, since OPM enterprise revenue is projected to fall short of total OPM expenses, enterprise and public, SSF would need to plug the difference with an annual allocation or subsidy. In effect, the annual funds that SSF would need to provide would be roughly equivalent to the public revenue that is currently allocated to OPM by the district plus whatever management fee might be negotiated between SMCHD and SSF. As noted previously, 3% is typical. Um, and I'm not, not going to read the second half of that, except it says uh, SSF would not find this to be an attractive proposition. OPM is a money pit, okay? I don't know that there's anybody in this room that disagrees with that, but the problem is we have a commissioner from SSF, but we have a commis another commissioner who's beholden to the people that control SSF, and another commissioner that I just completely don't understand. Uh, and there's just no excuse to continue on with this uh, JPA. Now this JPA agreement 
may be an improvement. I'm up in the air on that. I came in prepared to be totally opposed to it. It sounds like there are some things that are better in here, but this is being rushed and it, it, it's totally inappropriate with eight years to go, what is the rush to get this done? Thank you. Bud Rats? Uh, thank you. It's almost, it's been some time since I've been here. I've been traveling and so on, and I'm home now. Uh, the midterm uh, election emphasized the importance of citizen participation. And I would like to compliment you, the commissioners, for your additional commitment. When you were elected, you took on the duty and the responsibility to ensure to assure that the citizen taxpayers of San Mateo County that the resources placed in your trust are used for benefits consistent with the founding documents of the Harbor District. I have spent considerable time reviewing the proposed memorandum of understanding and find it much improved but incomplete, conflicting, and lacking clarity. This is obvious from the discussion previous to my comments. The district has no reason to rush the revision of the existing documents. I would suggest that each of you, commissioners, should be able and willing to engage in a thorough, lengthy discussion of the document, its implementation, implications over time, and the benefits derived from the investment of a very significant portion of the district's capital improvement capacity. Let's examine the motivations for the MOU. The city of South San Francisco wants to create a development on its landfill. The development wants to use a new modern marina, promenade with restaurants, hotel overlooking the waterfront. You only need to view their promotional materials to understand the importance of this. They do not want and cannot have a rundown marina in their development. They can avoid this investment and operating concerns by the district making the investment and continuing to operate the marina. This may well be in the district's best interest. However, before proceeding to accept the MOU as currently configured, there are many unaddressed issues to investigate. Why doesn't the city make the capital investment? How does the investment in the OPM fit into the strategic plan, which is currently under development? What are the cap total capital needs of the district for the next five years? What is the investment capacity of the district? What benefits are the citizens of San Mateo County making from an $18 million investment per the Dornbush report at OPM? The Dornbush report was not a cost-benefit report which was requested, but a limited return on investment report with some questionable assumptions. To whom the benefits of the pros? What are the perceived liabilities of the MOU? This is just the surface of the issues that you as commissioners need to understand to discharge your obligation to the taxpayers of San Mateo County. There is no reason for the district to rush to approve the MOU as currently presented. I would suggest an ad hoc committee where interactive discussions can fully explore the issues surrounding the MOU and inform your decision. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to open it up to um, commissioner discussion. Robert? Oh, you want me to go first? <clears throat> yeah, or should we have it? Go ahead. I'll be happy to have Robert go first. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to keep mine very brief. <clears throat> First of all, thank you, Steve, for the uh, presentation um, and thank both the Harbor District and city staff for getting us to this point. Um, I know that negotiations are never, they're never easy. There's a lot of compromise involved on both sides and this highly detailed agreement um, has been more than nine months in the making with public meetings, public notices, and it would be a great disservice 
to the city of South San Francisco Harbor staff and the community to delay this vote. So I'm planning to support the agreement. Thank you. Tom? Uh, I'll wait. Ed? Well, I don't know where to begin. Um, well, first I'll state flat out, I don't support this MOU. I was just reelected to the board and have spent a great deal of time talking with the public and spent and sending them information about my beliefs and values as a commissioner and my vision for the district. I ran on a slate with Nancy Ryering. Together we received 70% of the votes. We share similar values with respect to the district and they were very simple. And this is what I told the public when I was in public meetings talking about why they should vote for me. This is what I told voters when they called me on the phone and wanted to know what my views were. Number one, I believe that our commission needs to be transparent. The public needs to know why we make the decisions that we make. Number two, and I said this the first time I ran, I believe that environmental protection and development are not mutually exclusive, they can be done together. And then number three, the voters and the taxpayers of San Mateo County will, if, if you elect me, this is what I was telling the voters, if you will elect me, I will work hard so that you have a voice in the decisions that we make. So voting for this MOU would not be consistent with what I was telling people when I was asking them to give me their vote. As a commissioner, I don't have a clear understanding of how a decision was made and put forth, that put forth this MOU over the, over, for example, the, the management alternative, which I think was brought up earlier. That's on page 39 of the Dorn Bush report. And as was mentioned by several of you in the audience, the report clearly states that under this alternative management agreement, the city of South San Francisco would have to fill the gap in funds left by not receiving the taxpayers' monies. And it, if you consider the 3% that would be added to this, it's almost $2 million a year. That's a lot of money. So here's my problem. I can't explain to anybody in this audience why we would prefer this well-written Dorn Bush report alternative management agreement versus what we're being sold here. I cannot explain it to you. So if I can't explain it to you, given all the meetings that we've had, how can I expect you to understand it? Since I've been to more meetings about this. And while you've given us lots of presentations, you haven't once described to us in any of the meetings what happened in these meetings with the city of South San Francisco. Now I would posit, and when two years ago when I was on the finance committee, one of the recommendations from a member of the public who's in the audience now was you do not want to go into this agreement with negotiating this agreement with the city of South San Francisco without knowing everything there is to know about the finances and also about what the voters and taxpayers of San Mateo County want from the district. We got the Dorn Bush report which was a great recommendation for us to get and we managed to, to have our board pay for this report. What we didn't get is any understanding of what the public wants us to do with those tax dollars. So I can't see my way to voting yes for this. And also, we've got another eight years. So here's a quest another question I have which was not answered. In eight years, maybe even six years, the situation may change. What leverage will we have negotiating this agreement six years from now? It seems to me that, that it's quite possible that the leverage the district has even now is pretty strong. I mean, if we, if we say we would like to do a management agreement to 
to the city of South San Francisco and they tell us, well, we don't want to do that. So I wasn't in those meetings, so I do not know what the back and forth was, but it seems to me that we have leverage over South San Francisco. Who is going to take this on? Where are they going to find a, an organization that's willing to keep? I mean, let me give you an, a simple analogy. You're renting a building. The landlord says to you, I want you to renovate this building, and then I want you to pay for the opportunity to do that. That's what, this, that's what we're doing right now. Now, that's fine if what the taxpayers, the taxpayers of San Mateo County, if that's what they want, if they, if they feel this development in South San Francisco will benefit them, not just the city of South San Francisco, then that's something that I, I would say we would have to agree to. But I have no idea. So I suggest that this board wait until we gather in a little more information from the public to find out is, do they want this? Or is it just a few of the people that were in the, in the negotiations that want this. That's not clear to me. Sabrina? Thomas, welcome to us. Do you want to go now or do you want to? <clears throat> well, I think you're going to have to decide if uh, we can get anything done in four minutes. <laughs> well, we can extend the time until 10. Is there a motion to do that? Because we still have another item, which I think is pretty important, which is um, Johnson Pier. So is there a motion to extend the meeting to 10? Okay. No motion? So moved. Sec is there a second? Okay, the motion fails for lack of a second. So, Tom, do you want to speak or Sabrina? We have four minutes. Well, I've heard from boat owners, slip owners, folks anxious to set up tackle <coughs> shops, coffee stands, newsstands, snack bars. People from the Yacht Club want to see some development and improvement. There's been a lot of consideration put into this agreement on both sides. In the 1990s, when I started coming to Harbor Commission meetings, I heard about the Oyster Point development. I saw the pictures, I saw the drawings, and we have an opportunity to put that into effect right now. Everybody talks about the Dornbush Report. We've got uh, things in the Dornbush Report incorporated into this agreement. So therefore, <clears throat> I'm in favor of it, and I'm going to call for the question. I have, I have some comments. I have some comments as well. I want to have an opportunity to say. Uh, what was that, Steve? Tom was calling. Commissioner Matus is calling the question. There's not a motion on the floor, I don't think. I would like an opportunity to make my comment. Now I haven't had a chance to okay. speak. Thank you. Um, well, so if we're going to be up against a hard stop, we're going to have to extend the meeting because we're not going to lose this. You just didn't filibuster. vote to extend the meeting, Tom. Yeah, and you're, it's you're my playing turn. a game here. You want to? It's my turn to talk, and you're playing a game, and I don't That's go with that. That's outrageous. Okay, keep going. Shame on you, Mike. You know, I want my chance to speak there here. There are unanswered. The no. There are unanswered questions. Um, well, and I keep coming back to this. Um, you know, I've got here three pages and. I've been adding to these notes as this night has gone on. First, I want to thank the public because the public input was very clarifying for me and very helpful. And I also want to thank our staff at South San Francisco because I think you guys do an incredible job. I hear nothing but positive messages about the work that you guys are doing there and the management service that's being provided and the, the emergency response, all of it. So, I, I want to make it really clear that I think there is a lot of value being added by our staff um, at Oyster Point. I just want to make that super clear and I hope that gets back to everybody there because it means a lot to me that that message get back. I know how hard you guys work. Um, okay, I've Sabrina, been I'm over gonna there many, many times. For a second, because so I haven't I, had a chance to say anything so I'm going to, is there a you, motion to extend me, the time to 10 p.m.? Because I, Y'all are trying to run out the clock. I'd like to have a, a chance to discuss my views. Is there a well, motion to Well, I haven't had a chance so to say anything. Second. Roll call, please, to extend the meeting to 10. Commissioner Bernardo? Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. President Shank Brown? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? Aye. Commissioner Aye. I'm oh, sorry. Commissioner Matush? Aye. The so motion carries. I like to finish. Thank you. Um, so. Yeah. There have been a lot of terms flying around tonight. Um, this is not part of the 
the comments that I've been working on, but things like meet and confer keep coming up. That sounds like a recipe for potential litigation. That concerns me. I think our district needs to be careful because we have incredible legal fees and all of these issues with this agreement point to potential litigation and I am very concerned that we are putting ourselves in a very risky position especially when I hear our general managers say things like um, the terms are fuzzy and you know that stuff just doesn't work for me um, one thing that was mentioned earlier by a member of the public is that this is a windfall for the city and I don't think there's any other way of looking at it it's not a windfall for the district that's for sure and there if you want to talk about winners and losers we are the loser here okay there's no other way to look at it um, with the way this agreement is crafted I think that there are some good things in the agreement that could be useful, and I think that upon further effort, we could work on a very um, beneficial agreement that would be still good for both parties. Um, but we're not there yet. And um, you know, tonight I learned that we're actually giving up even more land than we've already given up. We've given up all of our lease revenue opportunities except for the slips and. Oyster Point Yacht Club, which brings in about $400 a quarter. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, can you even imagine like a big building where there's a, a, a restaurant kitchen, there's a huge meeting space, there's a bar, there's huge decks all around it with a, with a beautiful bay view, and we get $400 a quarter in lease revenue, I mean, there's, it's just, how could this deal have ever been made? It's so crazy to me that that is the case. And then with regard to, to Mr. Olam's comment, and he's, oh, he's still here. You know, I remember hearing Mike Futrell describe Oyster Point Marina as a horrible liability that they have put off on the San Mateo County Harbor District. And I don't think we have fully contemplated the liability factor in this agreement at all. And in fact, I recently was told that at Oyster Cove, which is our neighboring marina, that Kilroy, the development group that is doing the development at Oyster Point, um, is doesn't want anyone to know that they are responsible for Oyster Cove because when they took over the development, Oyster Cove was part of the package, whereas Pillar Point Harbor, I'm sorry, Oyster Point Marina is the San Mateo County Harbor District's responsibility, not theirs. Apparently, because they're a publicly traded company, their stockholders would not be pleased if they found out that they had taken on this high-risk liability because marinas are high-risk liabilities. It, there's so many things about this that put the district in jeopardy. I have many concerns and I just feel like we need more time to process the information and get into the specifics and make sure that we've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and we clearly haven't done that here yet, although I do appreciate the effort that's gone on so far. Um, if the draft MOU is approved tonight, per Steve McGrath's recommendation to the board, what is the path for the quickest and least costly method of terminating this agreement in 2019? I asked that question, you know, I don't know, months ago. I, I haven't gotten an answer that's, that's, that I can make sense out of yet. I got a little bit more information tonight, but it sounds like we, if, if uh, the board decides to terminate this agreement, it's going to create a huge mess for the district. That does not sound good to me. Um, where is the draft management agreement um, as proposed in the Dornbush report? I mean, you can't just go have the city manager and the general manager have these secret private, sorry, I should say private meetings, not inform the board about what's going on, not produce a draft management agreement as a proposal that the public knows about um, and then say that that just couldn't be done. Well, the way to do it is you produce the draft agreement, management agreement, and then you take it to the city 
in a way where the board knows about it and there's a transparent process. And then if they reject it, well then you go back to the negotiating table and you tweak things and you work through it. None of that has happened in any sort of transparent <coughs> way. I haven't been informed about any of it. I've heard that supposedly that happened who knows when. And, you know, it, it just doesn't make me feel like we are a public agency. It makes me feel like this is some kind of private company being run by our general manager and by the city manager of South San Francisco. This does not feel like how a public agency should be conducting business. And so I have a lot of concerns about that. Um, there's no parcel map. Clearly there's issues. We are giving up land, apparently, which has not been clearly uh, explained to anyone tonight. We are giving up, I don't know how many square feet of land um, in these, uh, these parcels called um, remainder parcels, and that should be made clear, uh, you know, clear to us. Also, what happened to the 40,000 square feet of retail space that the district was supposed to get from the city? Nobody said anything about that. I mean, we were supposed to get 40,000 square feet in retail space, and now suddenly no discussion about that whatsoever. Has that gone away? Is that still, you know, where is that in the MOU? I'm not seeing it, and it certainly wasn't discussed tonight. Um, I don't want to give that up. We have, we, we, we already gave up like, all the lease revenue lands that we, that made it even slightly worthwhile being there. And now we're giving that up, plus we're giving up the remainder uh, parcels. So I need to understand the parcel map. Um, the public needs to understand the parcel map and what we're actually parting with and what is being uh, given to the city. Um, you know, as far as BCDC goes, we should probably uh, get in touch with them right away and tell them that we need to get a revised permit because clearly things have changed so much from the permit that they initially issued back in the 70s that the permit is moot at this point. The permit should most likely be a joint permit between the city and between the district, which they do joint permits um, because of the nature of what has happened here. And I'm just talking about with the, the leased lands um, that we gave up uh, to the developer. And so just based on that alone, there should be a re-permitting through BCDC. <coughs> I have brought that up over and over again. I brought that up over a year ago. I've checked with BCDC. Our district hasn't done anything about it. We haven't checked in with them about the process for applying for a <coughs> permit. So I have concerns about that. Um, so you know, really want to know a lot about the support, 40,000 40, square feet. Um, because, because of these concerns and many others that are too numerous for me to even possibly delve into right now, uh, the list is so long after reading the agreement, it was just one thing after another after another popped into my head, like, well, what if this happened? What if that happened? And, and there hasn't been any willingness on the part of our staff or council to clarify, I asked for a memo, I asked for clarity on these issues. I haven't received anything. Um, I was given a lot of excuses about why that couldn't happen. I was told that I couldn't uh, be privy to any of the communications whatsoever between the district and the city. I was blocked from any being um, informed about any of those communications. So that doesn't work for me. Um, I support uh, investing in property that the Harbor District owns. You know, to me that makes sense. I'm a property owner. I invest in property that I own. I don't invest in property that I don't own. I think a lot of people understand that logic. Um, so I just have a really hard time understanding this. Um, I strongly urge the board to take more time to consider our future relationship with the city and to consider a management agreement as uh, specified in the Dornbush report. Um, I do like the suggestion that we form a committee to consider the agreement. Maybe that goes to the finance committee. Maybe it's another committee. I don't really know. Maybe it's a, a, a workshop that the whole board's at and the public can attend. Whatever the process, I think there needs to be a process, and we haven't had one. What we've had is the city manager and the general manager 
doing whatever it is they're doing, and, and we, you know, and we're just finding out about it. Um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, this agreement as proposed is not um, in the best interest of the Harbor District, in my opinion. As it stands, I do not support this agreement, and if it is approved tonight by, I agree, a lame duck board majority, I will support early termination in 2019, if that makes sense. Um, so I definitely um, want to consider uh, how we get out of this agreement, because so far, I'm convinced that this is not in the best interest of the district, and I want to better understand how we could get out of it. Now, I don't want to be in that position. <coughs> I would love to be in the position to support a great agreement, but we're not there yet, and I feel like this is being jammed through at the 11th hour. It's not fully baked, and I'm not on board with that. Robert? <clears throat> Just, um, I'm gonna make a motion, but for the record, as far as I know, um, I'm still an elected official on this board until my term ends at the end of the year per the voters of 2014. So on that, um, I make a motion to approve the draft agreement and exhibits with South San Francisco for operation of the Oyster Point Marina authorized general manager to execute and incorporate any non-material changes as may be requested by South San Francisco City Council. Second. Hey, can I just make a quick statement? Because everyone's had a chance to make a statement. Yeah. So, um, the, this is not an 11th hour agreement, and this is not a lame duck board. This board has worked on this agreement along with the city staff, <coughs> and our staff and the city staff and their city council, the liaison committee, for the last three years, okay? This is, yes, for the last, since I've been on this board, we've been working on this whole situation, actually probably even started before. So this is not an 11th hour thing. I want to make that very clear. Um, that's, we've had multiple meetings on this. This has been in the press multiple times. So if you're, if I, I'm glad that we have a lot of public engagement, but this is not anything new. This is nothing new. And I have to commend the staff and the general manager for tweaking things based on what this board and the liaison committee, um, but more importantly, this board, the feedback that, that we've given them. So, you know, I view this as an investment for the county. <coughs> the county and the public extend beyond this room. You're not the only people here. I've heard from a lot of people who want this agreement to happen, including a lot of people from the coast <coughs> side. So, you can call us names all you want, but again, we're here to listen. You don't have to respect us, but we do have to listen to you, what you're saying. And I have to listen to people beyond this room. So, um, if there, there's a motion and a second, so let's do a roll call, please. Is Debbie? Second? Yeah, yeah, Tom seconded it. <coughs> I don't like the tone of the threat either. I think it's disgusting. And that's the last thing this Harvard District needs. Roll call, please, Debbie. Commissioner Brennan? No. Commissioner Matouche? Aye. Commissioner Lorenz? No. Commissioner Bernardo? Aye. President Shank Rowe? Aye. The motion carries. It is now, what time is it? 958. We had one more item, but we have a motion. Well, there's uh, an extension to 10 p.m. If you would like to hear item 21, if you, anyone would like to extend the time. You may, do, you may do so now by making a motion, otherwise we'll bring this to the December meeting. Is there a motion to extend the time? Great. Is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Roll call, please, Debbie. Commissioner Lorenz. Commissioner Lorenz. Yeah. Motion to adjourn. I know I didn't hear who oh, you were calling. Aye. <coughs> President Shank Aye. Commissioner Bernardo? Aye. Commissioner Brennan? Aye. Commissioner Matthews? Aye. The motion carries and the meeting's adjourned at 9.59.